Welcome then to Manchester in the northwest of the United Kingdom. It's the third round of the UCI Track World Cup Classics. The best riders on the boards here for the third out of four rounds of this winter season championship. Here at the National Cycling Arena in the United Kingdom. This is how the tour standings run so far for the nations. Russia out ahead on 213 points from the Netherlands and then Germany. Well, we start with a look at the semi-finals of the women's sprint competition. It's the first day of competition and Tamili Abbasova of Russia up against Vicky Pendleton of Great Britain. Alongside me is David Duffield. My name is David Harmon. Welcome to this coverage of the third round of the UCI World Cup Track Cycling Classics. And uh, an interesting battle. And young Victoria Pendleton of Great Britain coming on in leaps and bounds, David. Yeah, she's running ninth overall at the moment in the uh, World Cup series with the points accumulated so far, but as we're going through, she's getting better and better. And this crowd in Manchester are right behind her. And when we had the opening shots, uh, David, I was so pleased to see that bronze of the great Reg Harris, who was a, um, came from Bury but spent a lot of his time in Manchester racing on the fallow field track, was five times world sprint champion. So I'm glad we're opening up uh, the program here with sprinting and the crowd. Uh, certainly behind the British girl who's making so much good progress. She started some years ago by going to the uh, uh, special track training in Switzerland where the UCI uh, bring on young riders and she's benefited from that. Well, Abbasova, a great stylist, very small, petite woman, uh, but uh, she's in a good position. She's going to take the run on Victoria Pendleton if she can. Pendleton knows she's got to go out hard and try and catch her napping. Great stylist, the Russian. And Vicky Pendleton, just look how quickly Abbasova is coming around the outs. She's really, really motoring. And Pendleton's going to have to work hard to keep her off. And the Russian it is who just comes past at the last minute. Victoria Pendleton doing very well indeed to repel at least one attack from the Russian. Well, do bear in mind when we're moving into the semi-finals, you can go to the best of three. Working our way through into this particular part of the track uh, series has been sudden death. But right now, back into the second round. Can she equalize and then go to third? Well, Abbasova's gone off the front. She's decided to take a different tactic this time. And Victoria Pendleton having to go the long way around over the top. She's holding a line well. Abbasova, oh, almost takes out the front wheel of Victoria Pendleton. David, they can't object now, the new rules, and if I was Victoria Pendleton in the old days, I'd object it, but they have to calm down, the commissaires will make a decision, was the, uh, the, the, the surge from Pendleton, was she obstructed uh, by Abbasova? And if that's so, we go to a third round. Let's see this again. It's, it's a, it's a set, no, she just couldn't control, but it wasn't deliberate, but if that's, the judges say that she was impeded, they could go to a third. Well, I think she knew that she was in for a looking at by the Commissaire straight away. A little shake of the head by Abbasova, and they have gone to a third round. And how will this affect the uh, mental makeup of the race? Abbasova is now being passed all around the outside by Victoria Pendleton. Abbasova looking across. She doesn't look fully committed. Maybe it's affected her, and Victoria Pendleton going for the line, and she's going to take it easily. Well, that lifted the roof. The British crowd absolutely ecstatic at that. And I have a feeling, David, that uh, Abbasova was affected by that decision. She just didn't look fully committed to me. And she looked over at Victoria Pendleton, which is something that you really don't want to be doing. Here we go, look. She could see Pendleton coming up on her far shoulder. And look at this point here. The head is going to go up. She looks across very slightly. She knows she's coming past and she knows she's beaten. And for Victoria Pendleton, that girl Abbasso was the fastest over the 200 metres in qualifying. She's also the leader in the World Cup, so a great scalp for Victoria. Doesn't she look pleased? I would be too if I'd have taken the uh, championship leader 
right down to the wire and then beaten her comprehensively on the last run. This then the semi-final heat two between Alicia Frassoni of Italy and Kristin Mucha of Germany. Frassoni again, another petite woman and a very good rider. She's been coming on very strongly during the previous two rounds. Not somebody who was up at the top echelon last year, but a great sky stylist. But both these two know each other, David, because um, Mitchell was the junior world champion in 2000. Frisoni was the junior world champion on the track in 2002. So they've come up through the junior rank. And we're seeing a whole change in women's cycling at the moment. A lot of good quality talent coming through. And they've come through from juniors, and here they are at the senior ranks. The women's competition certainly been, in many ways, much, much closer than the men's competitions in this World Cup track cycling. We've had some very, very close competitions indeed, and Frisoni's dropped right down onto the curtain and now decided to take control of this race. Mucha, probably the woman with a little bit more outright power, and Frisoni trying to spin the pedals a little faster. She's worried, though, looking over that right shoulder. She's decided to go early. I'm not sure that's going to work for her, David. Well, these two are probably very equal on performance at the moment because coming to this, they were pretty slow in the qualifying time. Mucha was slightly faster than Frizzoni, so on paper she should get this one with her speed, but I don't think she did. Well, I think possibly that uh, Frizzoni managed to hold out after all just by the very narrowest of margins. That, of course, is what sprint racing is all about. So, second round, chance for Christian Mucha to get back into this competition. Coming up to the bell and Frisoni once again on the front, being forced to go to the front. I think Mucha is a little bit closer this time though. She's shut her down by about a half a bike length and she's not gonna let Frisoni go away. Here she comes around the outside. Who's gonna take it this time round and it's gonna be the German, I think. On that basis, it's one each, isn't it? So we have to have another, we get more for your money tonight. Going to three round, this is good. She's a happy woman, isn't she? There we go, and she, absolutely perfect timing. How close is that? Shows advantage of the photo finish equipment, and the judges get it very quickly indeed down the track centre. They can look at it, make the decisions, and get on with the next part of the programme. Well, it's all going to come down to a runoff race three on heat two. One apiece for the Italian and the German. I wouldn't like to call it, would you, David? No, I'm glad I'm not a judge. 12.691 for Christian Mucha. And looking very pleased indeed. Now fired up these two. We join in the last lap as they go take the belt. This time around, Frisoni's decided to take the wheel of Mucha and see if she can come past her at the very last minute. Mucha's gone early. She's winding it up and winding it up. Frisoni not unduly perturbed yet, but she's not going to have the speed, I don't think. Oh! An easy victory for the German Whoops. in the end. <laughs> and nearly there. You see these track, it's about, about a 47 degree banking on that, that uh, uh, sharp bend at the end there. And when she threw her arms up, the centrifugal force takes you up there. She nearly took out uh, Frisoni while she's uh, waving to the crowd. And quick reaction by the Italian after the race was over. Well, the men's scratch race coming up here. You can see that uh, a good gathering, including Bradley Wiggins, uh, who was back on the track after celebrating his success in the Olympic Games. Uh, not quite as uh, fit, I think, as he'd like to be. He's got a big road season ahead of him, but he's in there, and the British public come to see him. And there he is on the front, starting to steam things around. Bradley Wiggins, the crowd's favourite, but losing a bit of power today. Watching the moves they come through. This scratch race, uh, they thunder around here. It's going to be all down to the final sprint. Who's going to take this one? Lots of problems getting to the finish. Riders falling off the back. Only 13 riders left. On the bell. The French guy's going off the front and taking that one fine style. New will take it in from Ribbon of the Ukraine and uh, Kamalidis of Greece in third spot. Unfortunately then, looking back down there, Alex Rasmussen, who came into the series leading overall in the competition in the scratch. Didn't make it, he was fourth. But he still just keeps the overall lead, but the man today who won was from France, Neville. Well, the French 
Taking victory today, former world junior champion Jerome Nouvelle from Vladimir Rubin and Yanis Tamaridis of Greece. Alex Rasmussen, the Dane in fourth from Nikolai Trusov of Russia. And Britain's Tony Gibb riding for trade team DFL in sixth in that men's 15 kilometer scratch race. Bradley Wiggins only finishing ninth, lacking a little fitness. Well, let's have a look now at the men's Kieran final. These are the places 7th down to 12th. Uh, Pendiakis of uh, Greece, Ross Edgar of uh, the United Kingdom also in there. Escudo of uh, Spain, Pavel Buren of the Czech Republic, who in fact got penalized in the last round when we were in Los Angeles for dangerous riding. Let's hope he doesn't uh, do the same today, and Kasper Jensen of Denmark. Lot. Off goes the dirty pacer then, one and a half laps to go, Ross Edgar on the front, and he's got everybody to hold back. This is going to be a big ask for this young man. And you see there that uh, Jessen from Denmark, who's right at the back, has come through to try and close the door on the rest of them. That's a swift move by Jessen. He stepped in, stayed in the slipstream, so that gave him a bit of an easy ride. Ross Edgar's still looking over his shoulder. Jessen is right alongside him. And the big pushing and shoving from the Spanish rider at the moment, Ramondes, he's trying to force his way through. But Ross Edgar's still hanging on in there. And they go out down there. Buren's starting to come at him now. Well, Pavel Buren gone very, very early indeed. Very strong. Ross Edgar fighting back. Escarudo coming around the top. He's not going to make it. Look at Ross Edgar. He's taken out the inside. And held back Escarudo all the way to the line. That's a terrific ride by Ross Edgar. He's got every right to look pleased because he fought off the challenge of Buren, who came on early and had more stamina. Ross Edgar then taking the 7th to 12th place uh, runoff from Escarudo of Spain and Pendarakis of Greece. Buran went early and faded early. Moving on then to the Kieran final coming up. And that's your run down your list, those riders who thought their way through into the final here. And what a galaxy of talent we've got here. We feel like Wolf and Kelly particularly, Bourgoyne, and the man who's leading, well not leading, but the chance could take over here, Ruban, because uh, some of the riders have not qualified to finish, could shake the thing up a bit as they go underway. So from Germany, Wolf, uh, Bourgoyne from France, uh, uh, Yossar, the rider from Malaysia, good to see him making it. Uh, Shane Kelly, well, he's uh, no stranger to the Kieran, and Brunacroft from the Ukraine, just on our screen, just moving up the left-hand side there, Ruban of Russia is uh, sitting way at the back. Certainly still on the front at the moment, looking oh. good. Wait for it, wait for it, the dirty pace goes off, Shane Kelly has to hold everybody back, Rene Wolf is behind him, and Mikhail Borgan has gone straight away. One lap to go then, Borgan hits the front, he's got Kelly behind him, Rene Wolf just behind him, Vnukorov, then Josiah Eng, and then Sergei Rubel behind him. Eng has gone for a long one for the back. Mikhail Borgan has got to look over the top, Rene Wolf moves up the banking to block Eng, and, M and Borgan has got a clear run to the line if he can keep up this sort of pace but it looks like Rene Wolf is trying to come around the outside a long long way round for the German he's looking down on Mikhail Bougain it's a drag race to the finish and Wolf has got the power but unfortunately Rubin who's uh, looking to do well in the points competition at the moment overall didn't make it at all the way that Wolf went round that one just had a Bougain with Kelly behind him Kelly faded but there's no doubt about the strength in this German rider Wolf look at that and do bear in mind again the German riders are riding in the six day races which go on through the winter and uh, therefore they've had to pace themselves uh, for the World Cup series. So Rennie Wolf for Germany getting that one. Over the three rounds we've had so far, the winner today in the gold medal, Rennie Wolf. Let's have a look. You're asking him, your last round was really good and impressed everybody. Oh, thanks very much. It surprised me too, and I have to say, the, to go around that way was very difficult against Shane Kelly. And uh, Mikhail Bourguin, I had to do my best to win. Was that an authentic Kieran that we asked? Oh yes, that's a real Kieran. I really appreciated that race. A real Kieran it was. Hard fought victory for Rene Wolf.
Moving on then to the men's Edward Pursuit, and what a rider, what a cracker this is going to be then. The final between Escobar and Hayes. Uh, a rerun of the World Championships uh, when Escobar ran out to, to take the World Championship. He's on the left-hand side, that's why he's got the rainbow bands around his jersey. On the right-hand side, Rob Hales. Can he get his revenge on this occasion? As they get underway then, Escobar, to a large extent, uh, has psychological advantage because in the qualifying times he covered the uh, uh, four kilometres in four minutes and 23 seconds. Rob Hales is 4.27. The top four qualified uh, for the runners for the uh, silver uh, and gold and also for the bronze and fourth place. So technically these two have had to pull something out of the bag now. The target then is Escobar, the world champion. The time doesn't really matter in this particular round. It's the man who crosses the line first at the end of the four kilometres. 25, sorry, 250 metres per lap to make the kilometre. 16 laps ticking by. And at the end then, Ruskabar got that one. He had to raise his game, by the way, because he realised that uh, Rob Hales was going up at the same speed that he did in qualifying. Rob did in a great ride, but in the end, it wasn't quite enough. in the write-off for the bronze medal. It was the rider from the Netherlands, Hymans, who went round in 4.29. Obviously a lot slower than the runoff for the gold and the silver. That's good enough to take him into the bronze medal position, having beaten Fabio Sanchez of France, who did 4.29.77. Well, while Rob Hales and uh, Sergio Escobar now head the table overall, we move to the one kilometer time trial. Stefan Nimka versus Kandowski of the Czech Republic. And certainly the crowd here waiting for this uh, because we've got uh, uh, Chris Hoy uh, taking part in this one too, following on behind this particular one. So also cheer these riders, they go around. It's a, a terrible event really, the, the kilometre. You have to get your speed up to begin with, then hold on. You must, the, breath, the breath you take in to begin with, say it takes you all the way around, but certainly this is the one. And of these two here, Limka qualified in third spot in the qualification early on with a, a 1, 2, 0.999, and his uh, uh, opponent, uh, Kanovsky, went at 1, 3, 7, 0. So technically, and it looks like Nimka at the moment, is beginning to sort this one out and could probably uh, end up by, uh, by winning the one. So there we are then, uh, between these two, uh, here we go as uh, they cross the line. That's very close at the moment, 0.27. And the rider from the Czech Republic has got to come back at it. And certainly Nimka using all his power and experience on the track because uh, he has got tremendous surge at the end. And now he's beginning to put the pressure down. So it looks as if it's going to go to the German rider, which will give him the bronze medal in the competition. And as they get to, for the overall competition, 12, 10 and 8 points, he'll certainly put some in the bag for Germany at this particular rate of knots. And there it is then, raising their game. And uh, so it looks like Kalus has gone back into second spot. Certainly a victory then to uh, Nimka as we now move on to the one everybody's waiting for. Looking back in the series of this kilometre, when we started out in the very start in Moscow, Jason Quilly it was that won that particular one. Teal Boss has not ride today, won the round in Los Angeles, but for the British supporters, Chris Hoy is now on the starting block. His teammate, Jason Quilly, is down in the track centre, watching this new kid on the block, if I can use that expression, all the years he's been training, and it came off good in 2004 as world champion, an Olympic champion. Is up again, Ben Kirsten. From Australia on the left. Total concentration. And out of the start here, Chris Hoy is giving all he's got, and the crowd won't really get a good measure of it until they go past the lines on either side at half lap. And Chris at the moment has gone out like a bullet from a gun. They've got to stay right down close to that black line. If you swing up, you lose vital time. And it looks to me as if Ben's probably setting a faster start than Chris Hoy. The big, powerful rider from Scotland started out as a BMX rider. His father is alongside the track centre here, urging him on. 
as he always does, the dedication of this rider Hoy and the way that the Australians keep producing all these kilometre riders, it's going to be an absolute right down to that last the lap. I still think they're so close still yet again, but Chris is beginning to put the pressure on and Hoy's now got the lead. Curse has just dropped it back a bit. Can Hoy keep it? The power of this man, the hours he spends in the gymnasium, on the weights, the time he spends on the track, and it's paying off. It's paid off at 101. That's a cracking time for this time of the year, early January, and just look at that time, 101.67, and they're all applauding. And that's a significant time. Can he keep this form through to the next round of the World Cup? And of course, the World Champions League defend that jersey. Well, this is the first time that Chris Hoy has entered this event in the World Cup track cycling classics this year and takes a full 12 points ben kirsten takes another 10 to bring his total up to 18 and the gold medal for the individual performance in this round going to christopher Hoy from ben kirsten and stefan nimka the bronze medalist from the olympics in third well, well, let's hear from Chris. there were no traditional hogman a celebrations for me uh, i had to take it very easy uh, i was training on the on the new year's day so you know it's a bit of a shame the way the season has now changed around we have to train right through the festive period which I'm not a big fan of, but if you want to be the best in the world, that's what you have to do. Being the best in the world, what is your next ambition? All the awards you've got so far, come on, where are you going to? <laughs> I still have the same motivation and the same drive to continue, so as long as I'm healthy and uh, fit, I'll, I'll keep going. And, you know, I'd really love to, to retain my titles, and um, particularly Beijing in 2008. More points in the bag then for the Great Britain team. Chris Hoy taking victory by nearly three tenths of a second from Ben Kirsten, who moves up to overall leader of the three events uh, due to the fact he's ridden in two of them. Stefan Nimka, first time he's been out, bronze medalist in the Olympics. He takes third place today and eight points for Germany. Well, let's move on to the uh, women's sprint final. This is the race for the runoff for third and fourth, and Tamilia Abasova comprehensively beaten in the semis by Britain's Vicky Pendleton in the end, and looking a little shaky, not quite as happy as she wants to be up against Alicia Fresoni of Italy. These two pretty well matched in terms of style and power, both fast leg spinners and uh, great racing to watch. Abasova probably the slightly more experienced these two riders but again also they're the new kids on the block but they're coming through this one well, over leading that's why she's got the white jersey in the competition the women's sprint competition at the moment and uh, she's up against the, this rider Frizzoni is lying second in the competition so they've got a lot I think to uh, to, to settle today uh, at this Manchester track which uh, has certainly brought a large number of spectators in yet again and uh, the tactics are a little bit different at the moment. They're going to try and keep this one up a bit, but I think I've, I've so been impressed with the way they use the track because it's a very scary place to go. They're beginning to move on. We have seen them going right towards the top there, and that takes a lot of skill and experience and courage as well. But the whole thing is, they've got to, he's got to keep, she's got to keep the the girl in white, in white high up, but wait till she comes down. Look, she's looking for herself, looking back to see if she's going to come down. She's going to make sure she can drop inside that red line so she can't come inside her. She's got to go the long way round at the moment and uh, still out there look for a gap on the inside there wasn't one there but she's got the power Abbasova. so Abbasova I think is just slightly wrong footed for Sony there she thought she was going to drop off the banking and she didn't she came for a flat sprint off the end of the banking and in fact takes it very easily indeed well maybe she's just getting her head back together a little bit I think Frisoni was looking for one of those quick drops down off the banking to come up on the uh, right onto the wheel or on the inside and Abbasova just sort of psyched her out didn't do that and then jumped just after the bend and in fact it caught Frisoni out and she'd really given first race easily remember there are three races available if uh, it's one apiece after two well here we are then you can see the little green dot is uh, indicating that Tamilia Abasova of Russia victor in the first round and this is Alicia Frasoni Abasova still not quite looking all together trying to focus a little bit now drawn on the inside of the track and Frasoni 
Well, she gets a good start for Sony. She's off quickly, and there's, that's interesting. She's decided to take up the lead position again. I'm a bit surprised about that. She's probably had a word with her coach, by the way, because when they get back in the track centre, they go on to a set of rollers on their bikes to cool down, and then nobody talks to them until they get over, because psychologically, they're rethinking what's happened, and the coach will sit them down and uh, sponge them down, keep them warm, a bit of massage, and they'll go through what just happened, and the coach will often say, look, do this this time round, keep the speed up here. The coaches are very important, because um, they're always trying to analyse the tactics, and of course, the coach can often see things differently. Looking up here as the tactics say goes to the third round he'll begin to try and understand and look at the other rider because he can see the coach in the track center can see where Abbasova is and look at Abbasova whereas the rider at front is looking over his shoulder so the analysis is very important the pace a lot higher on this race than race one and they are spinning those pedals pretty quickly and Frisoni's decided she needs to take the pace out very quickly indeed oh look at this Huge power by Abbasova. She's just started turning those legs over, churning them much, much faster. She's got her right around the outside, and I think Frasoni's given up the ghost already. Another easy win for Tamili Abbasova of Russia. So she takes two in a row and therefore takes the bronze medal position. And the speed on that run, 58.8 kilometers an hour. That's, that's fast sprinting. So no way in which uh, Frisoni could come back at that one. But again, often depends if they've got other events yet to come as to whether you really blow a gasket in that last half a lap. If you know you're beaten, and he's back because there are other uh, events in the program that they're going to be riding over these three days. 12.235 for the winning time for Tamilia Abasova. It's about uh, a tenth quicker than the previous race, which was 12.39. This then the final, Victoria Pendleton of Great Britain versus Christian Much of Germany. And on paper you'd have to say that Much is the more experienced rider, a former junior world champion and a big strong rider, Shane Sutton there, an Australian rider looking after, former rider should I say, looking after the GB team now and he's always there trackside. It can be a pretty scary character if you try and talk to anybody when they don't need he, to be he talked was, to. He was, um, an amateur boxer. <laughs> now, Shane uh, won uh, the, uh, the milk race in Great Britain. His brother, uh, Gary Sutton, uh, was a world points champion. So although uh, Shane spent most of his time on the road, Gary was a track man. And now Shane is here advising Pendleton Tack. But this, I think, some great tackle. Look at this. That's what I say. Now, this is frightening stuff. You didn't just see this in years gone by from being track race, but they're spending so much time on the track now learning the skills of the sport you really have to keep the pace at least constant because you know if you slow down too much or try and uh, speed up too much and you're being forced onto the barriers it's easy to uh, slip down it's about 47 degrees this banking it's enormously steep if you're standing up around the outside there and looking down it really is steep stuff and Christian much trying to uh, turn the psychological screws on the young Vicky Pendleton She's not having any of it though, is Vicky? She knows she's good. Well, look at this. She's had to come from a long, long way back. I'm surprised she let Christian Much get so far ahead when the bell was coming around. But look at the power of this young British rider. She's got a lot of work to do though. The German is extremely strong. She's not going to take this one, Vicky Pendleton. About three bike lengths in it. And I think, David, perhaps she was a little too far behind when the bell went. Yeah, it's all right, don't she's got the, the all-out power at the moment, uh, Vicky. She's, she, she's pretty quick, she's very courageous, uh, tactics are good. I think she needs a bit more development time, and uh, I certainly think by the time she gets to, uh, um, to Beijing in uh, four years' time, she will have grown up and, and beefed up a little bit to get that power. And in fact, talking to uh, uh, Vicky earlier on, uh, she said to me, that's her target, is, is Beijing four years from now, so she can, I think, get the strength to go with her skill. Race two then, Christian Much with the little green dot, indicating she is the victor in race one, Victoria Pendleton. Now drawn on the inside of the track. I wonder if she's going to try and squeeze Much up on the barriers, just like uh, she had done to her in the first race. The speed for the last race actually over 50 and nearly 60 kilometers an hour. So not a slow race by any means. Well, she's dropped in down towards the apron at the bottom. Vicky Pendleton, got to keep a focus on the rear wheel and she's trying to uh, wrong foot Christian Murch. I think that'll be difficult. She's an experienced rider, Christian.
Well, this is very, very tactical stuff from Vicky Pendleton. Got to be careful not to flick that bike over too much. We've seen a couple of falls. I think she's leaving too big a gap at the moment, David, but uh, off the banking, she has the advance of banking. She's trying to use it now, but she's got to come a bit closer. Or she's got the slip, and she's closing the gap. She must get in the slipstream and be towed round. Two equal riders, a slipstream over those last 250 metres. You have a chance of flicking past if you're equal. And she's having a go now. She chose it right. That was good riding. She closed the gap. Can she now, coming down the finishing straight, equal a score, one all. The crowd are right behind her, but no, nope. it goes to Mush on the line. Well, she tried every trick in the book, Vicky Pendleton. The German very happy indeed, and rightly so. She knows this young lady from Great Britain is a se serious threat now and in the future. And she has every right to be happy. Gold medal for Christian Wuch of Germany. And extra points, 12 for her personal total and the country's total. And Germany, of course, lying second overall in the medal tables behind Russia, just ahead of the Netherlands. So gold medal for Christian Rich, Victoria Pendleton on the left taking silver, and Tamilia Abasova taking bronze for Russia. Well, certainly Mush was happy with that, and uh, she's just saying this is my first victory in the World Cup, so I'm very happy. I've uh, just been asked, uh, did you expect this victory? Oh, no, no, she said not at all. I never arrived with uh, any expectations, uh, and I can't imagine it did all work out so well. Uh, and I could just hope to be the first eight riders. Well, she wasn't amongst the first eight, she won overall. And every ride to be pleased, as has Victoria Pendleton with silver for Great Britain. This then the nation's rankings after day one. 48 points for Great Britain. They're heading up Germany on 43, France on 36, Australia on 30. Right the way back to eighth place, Spain with 15 points. China not doing too well, five points on day one. Belarus 14, Greece on 14 as well, Italy on 15. Day two of the World Cup Cycling Classics, the track cycling. Mikel Morgan versus Toby Jaker of Australia in the quarterfinal heat one of the men's sprint competition. And this man, the real rising star of France, taking over from Florian Rousseau. Florian Rousseau now starting a new career in television and leaving behind his racing days, retired just before the Athens Games. But a strength and depth for the French squad with this man, Mikel Bourguin, and Gregory Borges, the young 19-year-old rider. And it looks as though the sprinting power of France is set fair for the next four years as we run up to Beijing and the Olympics. Toby Jacob, another young man, the Australian, very, very powerful indeed. Had a few ups and downs, had some injury, had some worries. He's dropped out of the limelight, seems to be on his way back but he's a character, I think is probably the best thing to say about Doby Jacob. This man got a very mature head on young shoulders, Mikel Bonga. This is very tackle stuff, David, slowing it right down is Jacob. It is, it's again um, interesting, Francis has had so many top sprinters over the years, and uh, this young man is coached by Daniel Morrow, or past the multi multi uh, amateur world champion so they don't lack in much skill and experience in terms of that support but the bike about the French except for the indoor track at uh, Grenoble and, uh, and Bordeaux they don't have the facilities that they have in Australia for instance or we have in Great Britain where there's so much dedication to track racing so the Americans the Australians have got the edge in terms of, of training but they have to travel halfway around the world to come and ride, race at this level and I think somehow this is going to cause a lot of spill from behind is the school going to come against against the sheer speed of the new kid on the block no, that's a surprise. I still think, though, the Australians are not quite on full boil yet. No, I think their timing thing is a little, uh, little more long term. The French have been absolutely flying since the beginning of the track season. In fact, it's interesting, isn't it, that they don't have this track facility except at Bordeaux, and uh, a lot of them, of course, using the UCI facilities in Switzerland. But um, it is quite amazing that they don't have the. 
ability to get about. And in fact, Great Britain has more, more world-class facilities than France has now. And, uh, but showing, isn't it? It, it is showing indeed. But yeah. certainly in sprinting at the moment, it seems to be France are on the ascendant. Well, here we are for the second of the quarterfinals. This is heat two for Ross Edgar against Lusatz Kwiatkowski. I'm off Poland. Now, the, this is quite interesting, though, because we haven't seen a lot of uh, top-level uh, Polish sprinters, but this guy's coming on. Look at the size of him, too. Um, but he, yeah, he was cross when he was a young lad. <laughs> but it, it isn't always size that makes a difference. You have to have skill and understanding as well. But that fellow's at front. He's obviously got a lot of power. Uh, and, and Ross is, you know, uh, will a good bit big and beat the good little in here. Well, the interesting thing about Kwiatkowski, the uh, pole leading out at the moment, is that uh, so far in the two rounds we've had, he's only scored two points in the sprint. Ross Edgar, on the other hand, has uh, been very consistent indeed. A nice move there to go up to the front. I would have thought he was, what, would be nice. I would have thought he stayed behind the big guy. But you never know. Perhaps you think she can strike him out on this track. Well, yes, you see Poland, they? they've got indoor tracks, so coming Not in, at all. Train along no, no, I think they probably go to, they, they go to Germany to train, I think, in fact, and Holland. Ross Edgar, I'm not surprised Ross, Ross has come to the front, actually. You see this in his Kieran riding as well. He's extremely aggressive. He does like to be out the front and lead and go early, and he's a very, very aggressive young man. Maybe lacking a little in track craft, but it's coming very quickly, and maybe an overall power. But he's going to have to work hard to keep this big pole behind him once they get spinning. Difficult to stop legs like that. Well, here he is. He's using the banking classic racing style from Kwiatkowski. The pole. He's got it right around the outside of Ross Edgar. Ross Edgar. Edgar's going to have to fight to come back at him now. And around the last bend, it's the pole. The pole who kept the distance. And Edgar, although he pushed again off the third bank, just didn't have the power. Great racing by uh, Lusatz Kwiatkowski. Guys, a man mounted. When he took off, there's nothing going to stop him, was there? Well, he's certainly one of the bigger riders in the sprint competition uh, in this round. We've, there's a few of them missing, I have to say. People like Barry Ford, the big Barbagian. He's about six foot three or four. <laughs> Massive guy. So, Piagowski. Taking race one over Ross Edgar. Matthias, John Matthias. So I should say Matthias John of Germany and uh, Jose Antonio Villeneuve of Spain. Now, if you want big guys, this is the guy to look at. Matthias John of Germany is enormous. And Villeneuve is not that small either. Villeneuve is one of these riders who always looks perpetually happy whether you see him on and off the bike. But a very, very large powerful chap as is Matthias John in front of him very focused and again the race has started quite slowly quite tactically again David about the Spanish to them cycle racing is track is, is road racing and this guy's coming up here now and he's got use the skill he's got from a, also a small pool of riders but uh, um, they have to travel all over Europe and across the world to, to compete the Spanish ride because they're very much interested in road racing. But again, they look equally matched at the moment. But John Pop's got a bit more experience over the years. Yes! He's come off the banking very hard indeed. I thought he was going to go for the inside line, but he's just flicked himself up again and gone around the outside. Shut down, uh, well, a neighbor. And now he's going to look over both shoulders because this young Spaniard is very quick when it comes to turning it on. Here he goes, pumping those arms. He's just leaning on Matthias John and going around the outside. The Joe is going to have to work hard and he's not going to keep him back. Well, the young Spaniard just did a little lean on Matthias John and let him know he was there. And then just... I don't think people realise how incredibly difficult it is to up the pace when you're already flat out. And Matthias John knew he was beaten with about uh, 10 bike lengths to go to the line. And the young Spaniard, Jose, and Jose Antonio Villaneva, taking that heat. Heat four then, Gregory Bourges, the 19-year-old Frenchman, high up on the uh, banking, versus Tian Mulder of the Netherlands. 
There he is. Um, yeah, only 19, but uh, still medalist in the 2003 World Championships uh, in Stuttgart um, and in the juniors. And then, of course, he's gone on to be up there in the junior world and the team sprint. So he's developed very quickly indeed, but um, I think 19 years of age. My goodness, he's another large lad. Well, uh, I'd, my money would be on him for these quarter-final heats. He's uh, showed superb form over the last two rounds and uh, getting better all the time. We haven't seen any Japanese, in fact, uh, applying their trade in the in the sprints. They've not been uh, out in force at this round in Manchester, and they're always good to watch because they <laughs> spectacularly throw the bike all over the place. Gregory Borges has taken them all on every nation so far, and now slowing it right down is Tian Mulder trying to force Borges they've always come to a complete standstill there we are track stand that's the first one we've seen now word of, uh, about this it's psychologically they're trying to outwit the other guy but they can't roll backwards you see how they're flicking it now at the moment they have to go forwards the judge will be behind them and also there's a time limit now on, on how long they can stay there because the actual world record of a standstill was 40 minutes in Italy some years ago. And in the end they decided, well, perhaps that wasn't the thing that the spectators came to see. So there is a uh, limit and the judges after a while will wave them on. So it's only, they're only allowed a bit of psychological uh, cat and mouse stuff. But uh, if you stay there too long, the, the judges will either tell them to get on or blow the gun and restart it. Well, watch for Gregory Borges, the little flick on the handlebars. He's good at that. He does it two or three times. He likes doing it watching other riders suffer thinking about where he's going to go he's going to go for the inside line up on the banking again he's forced Mulder to take some speed riding up on the banking and slingshotting back down again a sort of double flick but Mulder's gone out very hard now can Gregory Borsch come around the outside of him he's keeping him there above the red line is he going to make it oh it's close my word that was close well, that was a pab, and uh, Mulder is like in the same uh, mould as the great Eddie Van Vliet used to ride against the great Reg Harris, who's uh, uh, bronze tacky we saw at the start of the programme, and those in the tracks I can see up there. There are two different types of riders here, the sheer speed of Mulder, but the power of Bosch right at the end there. And Bosch just taking about a rim's width victory over Tian Mulder in 10.981 to go through to the semis. Well, these are the defeated quarter-finalists. So, fifth to eighth place, Toby Jacob, Ross Edgar, Matthias John and Tian Mulder. Australia, Great Britain, Germany and the Netherlands. I prefer it when it's like this, David. I don't know about you. We've got four men on the track. This is when it all gets very hectic indeed and exciting stuff. Yeah, I, I come from the school of saying that we ought to have um, uh, you know, three up track racing, particularly on small tracks like this one. But in the old days when they had three up for sprinting, they found a lot of collusion. The two guys in the front would shut the fellow out behind, you see. So we're now going back to four here. It's, um, it's a point. They're going to be awarded points in the World Cup competition. So you do get some exciting racing. And you can see back in third spot, Ross Edgar at the moment. He'll, he's going to be the crowd's favourite. But he's been working hard all the way to get to this particular point. So who's got the strength then? Uh, Mulder, uh, together, Dyker, Edgar, and, and Matthias John, all good sprinter and ride, but he's different uh, uh, for them. They're not used to being in the position. Ross Edgar starts to go on the top to see if he can get up in front there to John of Germany. John of Germany still leading at the moment. Oh, Ross Edgar's dropping back as Mulder is in a good position. He's on the wheel. Mulder's in a very good position in a group like this one as Ross Edgar blows the gasket and goes out the back. Uh, on the front then, still John is going for Mulder's being towed round down the finishing straight. Can this lanky lad from Netherlands get? He has. So he takes fifth in the overall competition. Uh, John was back in sixth. Daco of Australia fading back to seventh. And Ross Edgar gave it all but could do no better than finishing eighth spot overall in the competition. There they go. And the crowd love that. Well, doing himself no harm at all was Tian Mulder, moving himself to 14th overall, 14th po uh, points, 14 points in the overall competition. This is the semi-final heat one from Mikhail Bourgain versus Gregory Borges. So the French against each other, believe me, no love lost. I wonder, David, if they don't race each other super hard until the very last half a lap, because they know one of them is going to go through to the final. And that's Daniel Moreau on the right-hand side, the most 
uh, telling of the track coach here in, in Crantown, the, the uh, Crantown of the French Federation. They split the coaching, one between the sprint and one between the, uh, the, the endurance ride, if you want to use that expression for people who ride the pursuits and so on. But um, here, right now, they'll know each other, these two riders. They know how far they are in their training. But they also know that in races like this, it gets you selected for other events in the future. So it's not just a matter of, well, after you, Claude, no, after you, Sissel. It's uh, down to the riders to prove the Federation, the support they get from the government, that uh, they're the best. So there's no way they're going to go and let the other guy take a freebie today. But they've got to walk, go around, by the way, at a walking pace. Um, often people say, well, that first lap, why are they going so slow? They can go as quick as they like. In fact, we have seen sometimes in sprinting, riders go from the gun and surprise people. But if you go from the gun, the other guy gets you, you get towed all the way around. So it's tactical to allow someone to get to the front. You sit in the slipstream. It's worth to be in the slipstream if you're equal riders. But it has been known for riders to go for an awful long one. But the trouble is on a track like this, these sprinters suddenly blow a gasket. They can't last uh, the complete distance. They keep it for those last uh, 200 meters. Now they're starting to wind it up. Well, Gregory Borges didn't really want to be in the, uh, in the front. He was trying to make uh Borgan come around the outside because his favourite position is to come in from behind, but Borgan knows that. He's keeping him in uh, check and looking very smooth at the moment. Now turns on the power, and I think Gregory Borges is not quite giving a quick look over the shoulder to see where Borgan is. He's just gone for it, and Borgan comes around the outside. Borges knows as soon as he passes his shoulder, that's the end of his race, and he lets uh, the victory go to uh, Borgan. Here we are. Borges with his head down, having a little look under his shoulder. Now he knows that Borgan's up on his uh, shoulder and uh, allows him to come by. So victory in race one for Mikel Borgan over his countryman, Gregory Borges. These two young riders, exceptionally talented. I think they take them with Russo, who's things that piled for so long. And of course, they've got people like Gary behind them. Tourneau's now coming into sprinting. The French have got enormous strength in depth. And uh, so interesting when we get to the World Championships, uh, how it will pan out. That'll be in Los Angeles. We go on to the second of the opening heats between these two riders. Well, Gregory Borges now up on the high side of the banking and uh, taking up his customary and favourite position of following. It's a technical point. Look, we're up closing up on the shoes here, David. Perhaps people following track rate don't realise that they still use, not only do they have the, the, the clipless pedals, they have the cleats and they have two straps on here because the sheer power when you pull up, you, if you're careful, you can pull your foot out of the pedal when they whap, go. And fact, I've seen track sprinters break the chains when they're going back from the standing start. The power these guys put down is e enormous. Well, I certainly know that Chris Hoy and the uh, the guys at uh, World Class Performance Plan and the GB team have put an enormous amount of research effort into chain strength because when Chris and the, especially his teammate Craig McLean come out of the block, they have been snapped, they have snapped chains in the past. There's so much raw power there. Happy to see this one, David. I uh, Bourguin should be the best on paper, but I know that Gregory Borges likes coming from behind, and we'll see if he's, make sure his chain doesn't snap. Bourguin, in fact, uh, using old quill-style pedals, I noticed. And in fact, the two guys, both using gloves, they look like they've been taken from motocross or motorcycle technology with big carbon uh, inserts. And look at this, Bourguin's gone out uh, early. He's got about uh, 10 bike lengths over Gregory Borges. Now, I think that's too far for the young Frenchman to come back. Well, I think that's a bit of a tactical mistake, David. Yes, he'll learn from that, though, as he comes powering around here. So, Bourgain's got that one. Two straight rides takes him through. So, that uh, in the semi finals, Borges will have to come back. I think also, again, once he knew he'd lost it, he's back. Because you've got to ride again later on or something, then you're always making sure that uh, you've got something left in the bag. A bit surprising, I think. Uh, he left him way, way, way too far out in front. You can't give a man of the talent of Mikel Bourgain that much room ahead of you. Well, his teammates there won't be too unhappy, but he'll go home and think about that, will Gregory Borges. This is the second semi-final then. Rosatsky, the pole, who so easily breathed past Ross Edgar and Willa Neva from Spain.
Bunaneva, the more compact, muscular rider. The pole was great muscle definition in the legs, but a bit more lanky, so Hyde did a bit better. Out of the saddle, just regulating his pace and forcing Villeneuve to look over the shoulder. And you know, that's, a, that's an interesting little psychological move. He's just bobbing his head up and down and uh, easing his palms on the handlebar grips as if he's to say, well, I'm just comfortable here. Villeneuve just upping the pace very slightly. I think trying to get three or four bike lengths over the pole. Maybe catch him napping. Kwiatkowski staying very high indeed and he's going to flick down and try and take the run off the banking very shortly here we go here's the bell he's still high on the banking is Kwiatkowski Villeneuve is going to be forced to stop the run in at him and he comes down now here he goes around the outside Villeneuve getting him to get out of the saddle now that's a bad move for him and Kwiatkowski can help a leather around the outside well that's amazing extraordinary racing by the pole so once this guy gets the power and then starts to surge forward, it looks like a brick wall to stop him. There he goes straight through straight on the outside. And he looks, look at the, on his face though, he's not completely blown either. That fellow's got a lot more yet to, to, to come, I'm sure. We're seeing a new kid on the block here in that respect. Heat two then, in his second semi-final. Piakowski with the uh, green dot showing he's won the heat one race. Jose Antonio Villaneva, the Spaniard, now taking up the position high on the banking. Once again, the pole just easing himself into the saddle very slowly. It's almost got a jerky style when he starts off. Well, Villaneva trying to keep very close on the rear wheel of the pole. He'll be looking over his shoulder. Just again, a little bit interesting point of view is that the, what they call the Azure, the blue bit they're riding on there. When the race is underway, uh, they're not allowed to come down into the Azure. You have to stay out of that, so you can't sort of drop inside the guy. The fellow's in the front uh, as the pole is now going. You can't come on the inside. And now he's gone up there. It's open for the chap behind to drop down in there, but he can't take an even shorter cut and go inside the black line and end up on the Azure. We often see it in the sprints. Uh, and just in the queue, and when they're coming down the finishing straight, if somebody drops in onto the blue bit, uh, then the judges will look upon that as a disqualification. Well, the big pole now upping the pace. He knows that uh, he can't let this Spaniard come around the outside of him. He's got raw, raw power. He's gone early. Now back in the saddle, just a little lift off the saddle for Kriakowski. Here comes Villeneuve, he's going to try and get, fix himself to that back wheel and then come around the outside. I don't think he's got the power, he's going for it, but he just can't go past the big Polish rider. He had the slipstream, he had uh, plenty of chance to sit in there, but he had nothing left when he came out of the slipstream, down that finishing straight. You look at the line, you then put your head down, and they throw the bike sometimes twice. The first throw will come here, but it looks like the pole knows he has, as there's one throw, he didn't need two, because if the other guy was alongside him, he tried one, one, and it's the second jump that often gets a victory. Didn't need it that time round. That's two on the trot. Well, moving on then to the men's team pursuit final, and uh, the crowd are right behind Great Britain on the left-hand side here, because undoubtedly this is the team that in the qualifying round uh, set the fastest time. That put them in to ride off the second fastest uh, team, which was from Spain. Uh, the third and fourth riders, Germany and Netherlands, doing their own little private thing. But Great Britain never lets up, right from the gun. They went out, and coming in toward the final lap, they caught the Spanish team uh, to go straight through to take the gold medal in a tremendously quick time for this time of the season. 4 0 uh, three was the time for Steve Cummins, Robert Hales, Paul Manning, and Christopher Newton. The silver medalist in the Olympic Games, uh, Great Britain, taking the goal on this occasion, and the Germans, who've always been up there in the team pursuits, having to settle for third spot. But the Australians weren't riding on this occasion, so they're going to have to start working hard, the Brits, when we go out to uh, Sydney uh, for February the 21st, I think we're broadcasting the programme. But there you go, as they finished in first spot, convincing.
Well, in the women's 500 meter, meter time trial, it was Tamilia Abasova, refocused after her defeat in the sprints, who powered her way to the top of the podium. Really getting into her stride and over a second and a half faster than Victoria Pendleton, who came in for a silver medal ahead of her. To the sprinting yet again, uh, so the women's pursuit now over and done with. That result you saw on the screen then, uh, Davis, Fate, and Tulik, one, two, and three. Miss Emma Davis now second overall in that competition ahead of Verena. Catherine Bates was her first outing in the individual pursuit. Well, now we are in the runoff for third and fourth place in the men's sprint. Jose Antonio Vulaneva, the Spaniard, against Gregory Borges, who lost out to his teammate, Mikel Morgan. Once again, uh, picking up that uh, favoured position behind Vulaneva. And two extremely muscular power sprinters, these two. And it started out pretty quick and pretty high on the banking. There's none of the... Uh, slowing of this down. Borge determined to keep fairly close and again watch out for that little flick on the handlebars. He does like to psych people out that way. Just rolling himself up and down, keeping Villanova guessing where he's going to go. Here we go. He's taking a long run at it and now he's really turning on the power of Villanova. Looking comfortable at the moment though, keeping him behind him. Gregory Borges has had to go a long way. Now Villeneuve puts his effort in and he's keeping a two bike length advantage over the Frenchman who's trying to come back at him. But a, about a half a wheel length victory for Villeneuve. Almost exactly half a wheel length and two absolute power sprinters. There's no real jump for these two. Once they get going, they get going and stay going. So Jose Antonio Villeneuve taking the first heat of that runoff for third and fourth place. All to do then for the young Frenchman. Now drawn on the inside line and will have to move out ahead of the Spaniard. And I think you would have preferred it the other way around, David. Yes, the interesting thing also, David, is as this series has been going on throughout the coverage that we've been giving on uh, the look back at what's happened and some of the live stuff you're receiving here is that these guys we see them from time to time but the, the power that the amount of work they have to do out there they have to that, to recover from it you think oh it's just a quick sprint but the explosion they put in there and it just depends now we've seen in some of the sprints when the second guy just eased back to leave a little left there so has this been another occasion when dropping back in the second spot has left him a little bit more as though he'd been saying well i'll just drop back a bit and i'm now equally uh, the score this time round did he just preserve it then we shall see the young frenchman in his favorite position now he's get, look he's just flicking that bike back and forwards it's sometimes capable of just uh, psyching the rider out in front he does like to do this yeah he's looking for the inside and uh, well, the neighbor's not letting him get inside that better. He's taking it back up again. He can do that, provided he doesn't sort of completely switch. And he's left a little bit gap open on the inside, but he, yes, now he's closed back down inside the red uh, line, which means the Borge looked for a gap through there, couldn't quite make it. I think he's running out of steam. He's got to pull something out here to level the score, but still, the Spanish Villa neighbor has got the edge on him, coming down the finishing straight, but Borge comes out to him. Oh, that's close. He kept something back, but was it enough? Doesn't look like it to me. Well, thank goodness for uh, photo finishes. Jose Antonio Villanueva taking that one again, but it was a little bit closer this time. If the finish line had been a metre further, then the result would have been different. That's how close it was. But there we are, Villanueva taking that uh, second one on the truck. So the bronze medal going then to Jose Antonio Villanueva of Spain. We move on to the men's sprint final. This is race one. Mikhail Bourgain of France versus Luzatz Piaskowski of Poland. And once again, that sort of slightly jerky out of the saddle style. That big uh, fixed gear turning. Settling his hands on the bars. Well, interesting point, I didn't have 
car to chat down the track centre. It's difficult when you come in to see all these things, but it's interesting that the uh, big uh, Polish buyers buying with steel handlebars. Most of the top sprinters use steel, but I'm pretty certain, and I'd like to have a quick look down the track centre at the handlebars used by the uh, the French because they're black and I wonder if they've gone to carbon fibre and they are yeah you, they're you all did carbon. see it did you? Yeah, no I went down and uh, spoke to the French they are everything on their bike is carbon fibre just about apart from the bottom bracket and chain and turning bits but the handlebar handlebar stem in fact even is now made out of carbon although it's an adjustable one much as they've had over the past few years in aluminium Kriakotsky, I think, probably needs steel bars. He's a big chap. And there's still that uh, wonder about whether Carbon can stand up to the sort of power uh, that this man is going to put through them. He's going to take a very long run at Mikhail Bogat. And I think he feels he, feels he has to get his legs worked up to a big pace to go past him because Bogat is extremely good. Here they come. He's trying to go around the outside. Bogat, Bogat has just paced him and easily takes victory in race one. That's impressive. Yeah, he rode just the sort of race, he used the banking, dropped down the inside, had a little look, and up, he's looking down inside, he can see, he's looking, 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 he can see the guy is just coming onto his shoulder, and then he knows when to go, and in fact, he made it look quite easily. There he is, looking back now, he, he, he knows he hasn't got to go again. The question is, can Kwiatkowski going into the next round get something, did he just sit back and go to equal the score? 10.912, the time for Mikel Borgat. You know, that, that translates to over 65, nearly 66 kilometers an hour across the line. That's about 40 miles an hour, isn't it? In English money. So it is. So Borgat now taking up the second spot, coming down fairly quickly from the banking. And both races we're seeing, they've dropped down to the Azur. Interesting because uh, Kriakowski certainly was trying to push people up on the banking earlier. Looking to do something again now, I think. But, uh, yeah, driving at this sort of speed, it makes it difficult for uh, Bulgan to, to jump him. He keeps the speed at a reasonable level and have to go say, just a walking pace. Well, I think the pole will want uh, Bulgan to come through if he can because uh, Bulgan is the sort of man who can jump somebody, and I don't think the pole has that sort of zip in his legs. He goes for big long ones, he uses his power and gets those big pins of his, those legs of his turning. Oh, a little flick down on the inside for Borgai. He's decided to take control and push Kwiatkowski up to the barriers. Oh, I love this. And there they go. They've had the little moment of flicking. Off they go. This is really tactical stuff. Borgan has decided to hit the front first. Can Kwiatkowski use those big legs to churn himself back up to the front? Here he comes around the bend. He's working very hard indeed, but I think Borgan has got the measure of him. He has the Frenchman taking gold here in Manchester. What a race of this man is, and what a prospect for France over the next four years as they run up to the Olympics in Beijing. And, of course, the World Championships. Nobody's discounting this man. He's in such good form. And the French are coming good in this competition because they haven't done much out in Moscow. They went off to uh, Los Angeles and started scoring points there. They've now come good uh, in Great Britain and uh, still some way to go in the World Cup. But there we are. 68.2 kilometers an hour the speed for Bourgain as he crosses the line. Well, that takes him up to first in the competition overall after three rounds. He has 24 points and some more in the bag for France as well. Kukowski on 12, but Gregory Borges, thanks to his fourth place, has moved up to second overall. So, over the third uh, round, we now have first and second for France. Let's hear from the points race, where I know that I, I'm sure a uh, chap doing the editing will go us live and then come out and come back again, because we've got an interesting setup here with Bradley Wiggins, uh, who I think had a disappointing uh, start for in the scratch race, wasn't it, earlier on the other day, or yesterday, but I think, uh, and Colby Pearson, another man to be looked at, they're very interesting, but the points race, uh, I'm apologising in advance, it's very, very difficult to follow, even for people at the track, isn't it, David? And the whole thing is, not only are they getting five, three, two, and one, 
one point every 10 laps. But if a little breakaway group like we had yesterday in the women's race get a lap, they get 20 points. So you can still be getting 20 points for just going a lap up, and it's a lot of work to do to get that same number. So the thing to do is to keep the pack together and sprint it out all the way through. We don't also have um, the double points in the last lap like we used to do. It's now straight down then as we pick up with Bradley Wiggins on five, uh, three, two and one points uh, every 10 laps with 20 laps, 20 points given uh, if any of the riders lap the field. Very complex thing to follow and uh, we'll pick it up as it goes on its way through and then come back to it uh, later on. It's up to you, that's what we're going to do. <laughs> we're facing for it, aren't we? <laughs> Well, they're always fast and furious, the uh, live coverage of track cycling here on Eurosport. Bradley Wiggins looking uh, quite relaxed. Good little smile on his face for the Olympic champion, Olympic individual pursuit champion, the best performance by an Olympian for 47 years, I think it was. OBE, Mr. Bradley. Ah, yes, o Bradley Wiggins, OBE, OBE soon to be father. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> Only blind to rear. Um, I hope he, and of course, we saw Chris Hoy getting the, the kilometre yesterday. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, hang on, no, he's MBE, isn't he? And, and Chris is OBE. Which way around? No, 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 he's OBE. He's OBE. He's definitely OBE. Oh, and the other one's MBE. But he's, M and he's MBE. Right. There we go. <laughs> Yes. Another medal to hang on the wall. So the 30 kilometer points race off. And as David said, it's, um, it's a complicated uh, race where you gain points for within individual sprints at a set number of uh, laps. And you can also go a lap up on somebody and you can also come over the line first. Not necessarily the person who comes over the line first who wins. It depends who's accumulated the most points during the race. Colby Pierce, the uh, American, was the best performer in the last round. Well, that was absolutely probably the spectators in Los Angeles. And they went farmy, didn't they? When it's come down to sort of the final sprint. I wonder if we're going to see the same thing from Bradley Biggins, who, by the way, is uh, going to be packing his bags uh, in a, a couple of days' time. And he's off to uh, the Tour Down Under in. Uh, uh, in Australia, in Adelaide, where I will also be joining him for a spot of sunshine, and that will be the first of his road races for the season. And, and uh, um, he's, he's got his eyes set upon riding on the road more this year. In fact, he's openly said, I think he's going to take two years off the track uh, to concentrate upon the road. And I wonder if he'll qualify for his team to take part in the uh, in the Tour de France, because he'd dearly like to win that opening prologue. So, Brad first sprint coming up. Well, let's just run through very briefly before those two laps are up. Uh, once again, these are the rules. 120 laps, that's uh, the equivalent of 30 kilometers, if you work it out, 250 meters per lap. There's a sprint every 10 laps. You can hear the bell. We're coming down to the first sprint. Five points for the first man over the line, three points for the second, then two, and then one. If somebody gains a lap on anybody, they get 20 points. Remember, it's not necessarily the first man over the line. It's the uh, rider with the most accumulated points, and that looks like Tony Gibb, who's going to take the points. Yes, indeed. Five points for Gibb. British rider. Nobody can really contesting it with him. Come back up dreams for I think, isn't he, David? He's, had the, you know, he's always been good at this sort of race. And Madison's written some out to six and so on, but I think he's just coming back after a bit of injury, and he's showing his track craft and... Uh, taking those five points. And the, the difficulty is that after uh, a sprint like that, you often then get um, a, an attempt to break the things up. So there we are, Tony Gibb, and that will count some points towards the British uh, score. One of the new teams on the block, DFL, just uh, started this year, sponsoring, and there you are. He was just seeing his colours for the first time on uh, Eurosport here. Welcome to you all, if you just switched on. I'm David Duffield, and David Harmon is trying to keep the score in this one, as we've now got 107 laps to go. Interesting that Tony Gibb is not riding in uh, the Great Britain colours. He's not part of the Great Britain squad. He's riding for DFL, which is a trade team. Maximum number of points. He's helping people like Bradley Wiggins, who may turn on the uh, power a little later on, by denying other riders points. Well, Colby Pearce... Uh, Upping the pace a little bit, wheeling off on the uh, Ukrainian rider, I think it is, Kazakhstani rider, sorry, out at front now, and they're trying to make a little bit of a break. Two riders ahead now, Ukrainian and Belarusian. Well, certainly 
They're trying to do what uh, riders would like to do, but I think they need more than this to get out there and uh, whizzing away their own. That's uh, Kirienka from Belarus, who's sitting in with the rider from Kazakhstan and uh, could give them a chance to get in some extra points. And they're not what I call top riders being rude about. They're, they're not the ones that um, would be marked. And this is the danger of points racing, is that all the top guys are watching each other. We saw Bradley Wiggins moving out and keeping an eye on the Dane rider back there. They've now lost nearly half a lap. Now, they're going to be left out there to fry. The, the main field has got to start work, but when they look round uh, the riders, they're going to say, it's your turn, you do this, and this is the danger point uh, when two riders start to get away, and there, uh, Janoskoy of Kazakhstan, as they now go to the next of the, the points coming up, and do bear in mind it was uh, uh, Gibbs that got the five last time. He's not in the frame for first and second at the moment. It's these two riders with the Kazakhstan rider on the front, Belarus just following on behind, and they're going to get the points five and three, and who's going to get behind them then? And that was close. To none of the top contenders still playing any interest in this. Not, they're not taking any interest. This is the danger time, by the way. Well, that was Van Melchen, Walter Van Melchen from Belgium, who took the uh, three points. And one of the Spanish riders coming in just behind him. And the Belgian just in there getting two and one, so that's a little adding to the score. So, Chineshov taking uh, five from Renka, and three Van Melchen, Melchlin with uh, the third placing in that sprint. So two sprints over, another eight laps to go. Andres Muller, it was a German, just obscured his jersey there, looked a bit like a Spanish jersey. Also getting some points, so that's how we stand after two sprints, five for peace to Chinishoff and Tony Gibb, riding for DFL, the trade team, the rest of them all riding for national teams. It's interesting the DFL team are allowed in, another uh, new British professional trade team to join MG. Rover Recycling and last year's uh, Enduro Sport teams and uh, a number of other teams have tried to uh, make their mark and now it's the turn of DFL. Nice to see this ruling that they can come in and ride alongside national teams and of course it works the other way around on the road now. Of course we are looking at a, a new change in the whole schedule because we've got the World Championship coming up in March. days and right now this is the sort of activity uh, points are very much part of six day racing four points in Madison with interspersed with special scripts as uh, yet again danger coming in here Colby Pierce my goodness he excited us in uh, Los Angeles didn't he he certainly did one lap then to go uh, for the next of the spreads Colby Pierce has really uh, turned the heat up again really trying to make it work and Bradley Wiggins on the front again with uh, the Kazakhstani Chernichov and the three of them coming up to the line and Wiggins it is taking the five points at that sprint point. And I think he's going. I think he's still going, David. Well, for interest to see what, what Wiggins did there for the five, is he still going on with this one? Uh, and certainly these are tactics. Colby Pierce moving across into the third spot. That's a, again a little, little a taster that this fellow is determined to stay near the front of the activity and is not going to let anybody get away. And, and Bradley must be um, a man to watch. Now he's easing back a bit, um, Bradley, and I wouldn't be the least bit surprised to see if he doesn't try and uh, uh, go for a lap. Well, he's certainly in the top five or six riders who are just trying to stir it up and pull away again. Three points to Chernichov, uh, Colby getting two, and Hester, the Dane, with the first points in the sprint today. Tony Gibb on the front there on the inside of the track. You can see in that sort of slightly mottled white outfit. And I think he will be working with Brad Wiggins. There we are then. That's the overall so far. Chernichov with eight, Wiggins with five, Gibb with five. Grenka of Belarus also with five. So long way to go, 86 laps still to go in this 30 kilometer points race. It's always amazing to me how quickly they come around to each 10 lap sprint. Yeah. <laughs> it's even worse when you're in the midst of the race here. To watch what's going on. Absolutely incredible. I speak to our colleague Russ Williams, who's a multiple 
world champion at the Masters in the points race, and also people like uh, Nick Ives and even Chris Newton, who was a world champion in the points race. And I say to them, well, I've said to them so many times, can you explain exactly how it works? And they all go, no, I haven't a clue. So it's as confusing for the riders as it is for the officials, and sometimes the uh, viewer. Colby Pierce then still uh, somewhere near the front. He's determined to build on his success. Brad Wiggins about six or seven back. It's all getting a little bit hectic. People were up and down the banking and somebody's going to try and go for a lap in a minute, I think. And with Escobar uh, stopping, I think, from his ride yesterday in the pursuit. I wonder what strength he's got. It's a mainly what I call road ride. Flicking it, we just saw him go off the front. He's a very uh, good all-round uh, road rider. We've seen him a lot on, uh, on our road coverage. And it looks now that they're beginning to uh, sort of um, stretch it out. Yes, looking down the World Cup so far, uh, Ignitev um, scored 6 and 12 with 18 points. Uh, Chef is not riding the D Dutch rider. Colby Pierce uh, is third on the championship at the moment. He got 10 points from uh, Los Angeles, uh, which has his 10 there. So uh, he's a man who uh, they've got to watch out for this guy. And uh, Lazar from uh, the, the Czech Republic, so again, it is not riding. So Colby Pierce has a wonderful opportunity to move up on the, the overall um, World Cup series. He keeps this up. Well, the Belarusian, Kirenka Val Vasil Kirenka, taking the maximum points at that sprint point. Sandy Flickinger actually over in uh, third, and uh, Colby Pierce still accumulating the points. Kirenka it was taking maximum five points from Angelo Ciccioni, and it was Nikita Eskov of Russia, in fact, who was third, and Colby Pierce fourth at that sprint point. So another point in the bag for Pierce. He is aiming to take over the lead. It's amazing, though, um, David, that he really is the only American to be showing anything in any discipline uh, in the World Track Cup. When you consider how dominant they were in Los Angeles in the Olympics, really not um, the force they once were, maybe. Some overall situation at the moment. A lot to go for yet. Getting to be about half a lap up and. Uh, once the riders lap the field, they get 20 points automatically. And Colby Pierce has taken a good ride here. He's done very well. He's seen that uh, Kienka from Belarus was determined to stay out there. Ciccioni from Italy is with him. There's a Greek rider in there as well. And Colby Pierce has tacked onto the back and decided that this is a good move to go with. And that is uh, Tamaridis of Greece, I think, who's in there as well. Good ride. Eskov, Nikita Eskov, who took uh, points in the last sprint, now hitting the front, driving it on, and they're going to have to work hard behind to try and stop them getting a lap and 20 points. You really need a shot of both sides of the track so we can see how close they are. Tamaridis working hard. The Greeks have come on very, very well in track racing in the last five or six years. Worked very hard indeed towards Athens, and they're Keeping it going, there are regulars here at the Manchester Velodrome in the UK. Even when it isn't uh, a World Cup event, they take every opportunity to come over and race. They've been here at the Revolution Exhibition races. So another sprint to go. One's going to come from one of these five riders. Somebody's going to get out of it. <laughs> five riders and four points, uh, four to get points. That's a shame, isn't it? I wonder if it'll be Tamaridis off the back. I think so. So Colby Pierce taking maximum points from uh, Eskov, the Russian. Another five points in the bag for Colby Pierce. And will they continue to stay away? And they've caught up on the tail end now. And that's going to give them 20 points as well. And they're moving into that to back end of the race. They have to get into what they call the race proper. The, the big bulk of the road, not just one or two stragglers off the back. But uh, once they get there, they get 20 extra vital points. So Kirienka was third. So Pierce. And then Eskov, then Kirienka, then Ciccioni. And it was, in fact, Tamaridis. Four riders then uh, down to 
Ciccioni and Tamarid has just been dropped off the back of those uh, leading riders, have made the gap to the back of the bunch. It's all split up completely. Now, this is where it all gets confusing because you get bunch after bunch chasing after each other. Yeah, but the man is stopping now. Look, uh, Pierce has dropped uh, back there. Once they get there, the speed goes up again. And this is the time. You can now see the LC. They've got those 20 points added to what they've got so far. Those are the four riders uh, in contention because I, I fear that the Greek rider has been blown back out and might not get his 20 points. So we'd like to see those at the moment are the key riders. Uh, and uh, thankfully, as far as for concern, it seems to have gone a, a bit quieter at the front because Pierce was hanging on because uh, the R R Wiggins amongst the rest went to front, tried to make it go faster because they, the other thing to do is to blow him out the back and get back on, on equal terms. But uh, in the end, they've all gone back to normal. Now, this somebody else if you're going to get up there uh, with those the top four riders you have to gain a lap and those top four riders now can just sit in there um, when they start contesting the points by the way uh, even you still I know it sounds complicated but when they go round it is the riders that go across the line first second third uh, and fourth who get the point it doesn't matter that you've got a lap up and you're lying 10th or 12th you still don't get any points you've got to be 20 or 20 what you've got so far in this case here those riders will count the points irrespective of whether they are lapped down or not isn't it nice to see that brad wiggins is keeping in touch with the front guys here well there goes tony gibb the britain is Certainly on a good ride today and trying very, very hard indeed to pull out the substantial gap. He's trying to get points, maximum points from this turn round. He's being hassled by the German, but he will get five. Five for Tony Gibbs to add to his existing points. Andres Muller going with him. And Gibb uh, just looking over his shoulder to make sure he was at least uh, a bike length ahead. And I think uh, Muller decided it uh, wasn't worth chasing him. So those are five and four points. And Bradley Wiggins taking three points, I think. Indeed. And uh, we're taking two points. So, so five, three, two, and one in that order. Gibb, Muller, Wiggins with the top three places. Now, I was wondering whether Tony Gibb was gonna try and stay out as uh, some of the other riders did. And pull back that lap, but not to be. Krienka with 32, Colby Pierce with 28. And those are the two nearest rivals. And remember, they are now tacked onto the back of this lot and have to start fighting all over again. I think he's had it. Yep, I think that's the end of Tamaridi's race. We well, tried to go across and he just blew the gasket out. He went out the back. For uh, uh, Ciccone and Pierce in the top places with the 20 points and beat beyond there, they now start to score on the intermediate. Uh, every 10 laps, 5, 3, 2, and 1. Well, if Tony Gibb wants to make any sort of impression, he must make a lap up or at least get two top sprints and uh, nobody else can he? because he's a good, uh, well, he's 14 points behind uh, the third place man. Uh, sorry, fourth place man. Shoney, I think, has got 24 points, if my math is correct, and Tony Gibbs on 10. So uh, plenty of work to do for the Britain. It's having a good race, though. Impressive. There's Escobar. The Spaniard who won the individual pursuit yesterday over Rob Hales. Hales, in fact, had some good uh, coverage in the UK press today in uh, Guardian. In their sports section in the middle, there was a nice little article with Rob Hales written by William Fotheringham saying that uh, Rob is really aiming for world championship glory. Wasn't too bothered being beaten by Escobar. It's the man in the middle there. You can see with a little goatee beard yesterday and uh, all our best and everybody's best to rob a very much like man well respected works so hard with his teammates and of course i suppose uh, not unfair to say he's very slightly sh overshadowed by the incredible performance of bradley wiggins at the olympics but rob a very very accomplished bike rider and a former confidence professional hello Eric here in the background uh, the commentator and that is Willie Moore who's calling the shots for the public. Willie Moore, great 
Uh, Team Pursuiter, part of that squad uh, some years ago, they were collecting medals left, right and centre. Now the on-track uh, commentator, all the expertise being uh, sent out to the audience here, have come from far and wide to watch this, and of course a lot of the Manchester much of the people are coming here because they've been coming not only for the uh, world championship we've had here but also there's been a series of what are called revolutions races and um, they've been bringing the crowd in as they go back to Escoff who's improving his uh, performance at the moment, Escobar uh, and of those you can see uh, the, the trial of Escoff and uh, Kirienka, uh, those two are already in the 20 plus points for having gained a lap so a little battle's developing between those two uh, and we'll have to see how it works from here because they're going to watch each other like hawks and uh, I'm interested that Perth hasn't got in amongst these two as well because he could rather do it. There's the uh, Belarusian rider and there they can see what he's got now. He's gone to 34. Escob is trailing him at 30 points. Pierce is out of the frame. Seems to be uh, not holding that one. He's not, well, only two points behind Escob, but uh, here are the rest of them. You see, see those zero laps down there. That's, they haven't got those uh, 20 points in the bag and they've got to do a lot of work to get up there. At the moment it's not happening as the four riders have got the laps of watching each other like hawks. Well, they're, uh, these riders, including Escobar, Escoff, Krienka, and Colby Pierce, again trying to go for, not just for the sprint, but gain another lap, I think. And they're not that far short from picking up uh, st stragglers. The question for British viewers is just how far back is Bradley Wiggins. There is Escobar driving the pace along from Kirienka and then Escoff behind. Escobar going to take five points. In fact, he might even take more, David, because he seems to have caught some of the riders behind. Yeah, but the, the judges will have to decide where the race is, and this is a difficult thing because there'll be, there'll be stragglers now just going out the back, out the back, and starting to lose more laps. But they've got to, to, to make the decision which is the main pack. And at the moment, one, two, three, four, we, we've probably got a reforming bunch um, near the front. I, I'm not sure they're going to persist with this one, although there's a spirited effort here from uh, Escobar to go, but there's two, four, six, eight, ten riders here, and uh, they are half a lap away from what is left of the main field. There's half a lap difference, and one by one, I can see one or two riders start to come across. They recognize the danger here, and including, I can see that uh, Bradley Wiggins in that back group. They're trying to, these are, these are chaps leading at the moment. That's the overall situation, and on the far side, it's exactly half a lap between what is the lead group here, the top of your picture, and what is the remnants of the main field, which is on the other side of the track, uh, just going across the line, and uh, so they, constitute this the virtually about as many riders in the front as there is in the back so this is it's going to be real one and in fact they're breaking up at the back this is dangerous and this group here can start to go and Bradley Wiggins is starting to have a try to get across Wiggins is going to get up to them he has to make an effort now because the main pack was splintering Wiggins is being cheered on by this crowd they want Wiggins up with that leading group and if he gets there they've got to keep going often you see now they're easing back the lead group might think they've got it but one by one the guys are, is Wiggins going straight through and out the other side he's working his way through, he's on the back, he's working his way through, he's got to get his breath back, but is he going again, he needs a lap to be up there in a chance, and so he's now with the leading group, but uh, now then, that was, that brought the crowd right to the edge of their seats. Well, Bradley knows exactly where he has to be, he cannot afford to get uh, shelled out, there's some very strong men in the front here, there's a battle going on between Kirienka and Esov, the Belar Belarusian and the Russian. They are fighting it out together. Escobar has already shown how strong he is by winning the gold in the individual pursuit. Colby Pierce wants to hang on to glory and take the uh, overall lead. And Bradley Wiggins could not afford to be out of this group. And as everything started to shatter behind, he's come across. That takes a lot of effort to come across by yourself. Thankfully, he's there. And I think the pace, as you say, David, just dropped a little in the front. They're all beginning to come back together again. It has, and that means that the riders who didn't go with Bradley took it easy, if you can call traveling at 40 miles an hour, taking it. They've now come back, so we now have got this group back together. But Bradley spent a lot of effort and energy going through there. And uh, I wonder if he's got another chance to do something. Well, at least he got the crowd all warmed up behind him uh, as they go now for the next sprint. Bear in mind, we've got to watch out then uh, for uh, number uh, three, Kirenko. Number 21, Escoff. There, and here he goes. Positions. Look at this, David. He's going straight off the front to get five points. The crowd will love that. Pierce is going to get three. And I think it's Escoff who gets two points behind him. So five points in the bag for Bradley Wiggins. Now, Kirienka won't be that pleased about that. Colby Pierce will be very pleased. He, he held the uh, wheel of the fast 
Bradley Wiggins. And Escop went with him. Now, where is Kianka? That's the man we've got to watch because he was leading the points. 37 points he had. If Escop comes over with another two points, he closed the gap now. Indeed, two points to Escop. That makes him on 34, if my maths is correct. And Kianka still on 37. So three points now the gap between the top two riders. Colby Pierce gets another three points that takes him over the 30 mark he's now on 32 points it's all getting very close there we are they confirmation <laughs> i don't know why i bother okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we've got, we got some more points yet to go the interesting thing is yesterday in the women's race uh, we had to um Nicole Cook took part in the women's points race and she went away getting quite a lot of points earlier on and then she missed the move, just like Bradley missed the move, uh, to get up there and get 20 points. So she was uh, out of the frame as regards going for the bronze, silver and gold at the end of it all. And in fact, in the race last night, the women's points race, it went right down to the final sprint with four riders coming to, and two of them had 31 points each. So it was Catherine uh, Bates had 31 points going to the final and Carrera uh, was also also there with 31 points and uh, they had to do a lot of chasing to see how they work across it and it was right down to final sprinting we saw the four riders who had lapped the field sprinting it out coming through the front it made it quite easy then to pick out who was first second third and fourth thank goodness but it did change on the final sprint today but those are the four riders who had gained a lap we have the same thing here uh, with the men's race but so uh, while Bradley and others might be picking up a few points here and there they've got a long way to go to pull back those 20 points they lost when the field was lapping or was lapped by them. Well, look at the Bradley Wiggins looking at in a second or third group back now, and maybe that little effort's taken it out of him. And Escobar doing exactly what he can do in the individual pursuit. He's just powering his way by himself around, and he's now a good quarter of this lap, maybe a little bit more ahead of everybody else. This is interesting. Well, the pace is so high, it's already spat out the Japanese rider, Kei Ukida. He's retired, and he's looking across. Well, the fact that he's looking across to the other side of the track means I'm sure he knows he's quite a way ahead. And Pierce doing the chasing. Pierce taking another two points? Yes, yes. indeed, yeah. Thank you, he's second, so it's by three. I think, I think he gets across the line first. No, there's first, that's five. Here we come. There's Escobar. Five points in the bag for him. Now, Pierce is definitely chasing. Yeah, there's three for, for, for Colby Pierce. 35 points now for Pierce, and look behind him, there are no, none of his rivals. There's the nearest of his rivals, Eskoff, so Pierce moving up at a second overall. Maybe he's coming back. 35 plays 34 in favor of Pierce over Eskoff so far. And uh, Pirienka on 37, so it really is very tight at the top. Escobar dying. His head's beating to rock, here he is. He's looking down his bike back, and I get some more speed from. Here we are, confirmation. Kirienka leads by two points over Colby Pierce on 35, Escoff on 34, and then a big gap now opening up to Ciccioni, Angelo Ciccioni of Italy on 24 points down. Interesting with the Italian, we'll try and keep an eye on him as well. He's going to try and use his uh, strength to get another lap. We'll see. 22 laps now to go here in this 30 kilometer points race now remember that's over 100 laps when they started 120 laps if you work it out 250 meter track and Escobar's going to go for another five points the bell is gone he's still out by himself so he's going to move up the table he's got a long way to go if he wants to catch the other guys like Kirienko who is now taking up the chase for second he needs the points he can't let Colby Pierce get too close to him or Escobar they're all in there look and it's the German, in fact, Müller, who takes uh, the second spot from Kirienka. So Kirienka, another two points in the bag for him. Here we go, look. Müller from Kirienka, then Eskov, and then Kobe Pierce, and then Tony Gibb. Yeah, just a comment about this, David, but I know it's confusing maybe for our viewers. Why the riders who are uh, down 
uh, one lap against the four riders who will see the scores in just a moment. Why they're still going for the points, sprinting here, is that although the gold, silver and bronze go to the top three riders, there are points allocated in the World Cup down to 10th place. So in other words, they've got to keep going, even though you may not be in the four-man breakaway group here, because at the moment, uh, that's going to be, um, the points will come down from the top guy there, 10, 9, 8, 7, on the, on the, on the score all the way through. So further down here, as we're seeing here, they're gaining points for their nation as well. So even though Bradley Wiggins uh, may not be getting up there to get uh, himself a gold or a bronze, he can help Great Britain in the point score, for the top 10 counting the points overall to the World Cup by the end of the season going to the, the Spanish rider who certainly has moved himself up as Sadari goes on the final lap. Well this will be another five points in the bag for Escobar. That'll take him to equal with Ciccioni in uh, fourth place on 24 points. Currently on 19 for Escobar. He's really met really has been motoring to get those points. Tony Gibb at the front while well, Escobar sitting up. He's done his work there. And it's Bradley Wiggins taking the next set of points just over, I think. The Russian, I think. But... Well, I think there was somebody interspersed between the Russian and... Uh... That's right. I think there was... Uh, I think, actually, there was somebody just in between there. So, uh, let's have a look. Here we go. Bradley Wiggins taking three. Then it was Muller, the German, then the Russian, and then Tony Gibb. And Colby Pierce missing out on the points there. So Kirienka Well, Colby Pierce needed to be a bit higher because Ignatiev, the Russian who was leading the uh, championship standings, has not been uh, toppled. Colby Pierce needed to be higher up and accumulate more points to win this race. And uh, it is uh, Ilya Kirienkin, sorry, Kirienka of Belarus. Wearing number three, who finishes today with 39 points from Colby Pierce on 35 and Escoff on th uh, also on 35. Escobar finishes on 24 points, but I think he probably won more sprints than uh, his nearest rival, Ciccioni. That was the point I made. See, uh, Ciccioni, although he got a lap up and got 20 points, he never made a, a, a move to do any better than that. So Escobar, those last few laps when he clicked those five, 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 that's put him up there. It hasn't put him on the rostrum, but it's, it's given him a, 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 val a valid fourth spot overall uh, in the overall uh, uh, competition for the, the World Cup. That's a very interesting ride. See, there we are, uh, Ciccioni. They were the same point score, but he took the final sprint, and that's why he's, he's gone up there uh, into that position. Bradley Biggins for Great Britain scoring overall useful points as well and uh, there's the rest of the rundown of the riders who finished this points competition. This race team on 10 points. Good ride by Gibb. If my rhythmic is correct in the overall I reckon that he's uh, got 18 points overall and I think that Pierce then in third will get, to, this is the overall competition going forward, uh, we'll get eight points, make 18, and the leader Ignatyev has 18 points as well. So it, it could be a tie. So we'll have to wait till they top the points up to the points because it's the overall points competition. But uh, I, I'm, I'm confusing people. But anyway, starting with the runoff for third and fourth between uh, Karen Turing of Switzerland and Verena Jus of Germany. Use on the right-hand side of your screen, and of course Turing in the Swiss colours there. Uh, going back to where it all started, uh, David, they, they have the, uh, what they call the qualifying straight away through. All the riders go on the track, and it's the top four riders that take part in the ride-off. The fastest uh, and second fastest go for ride-off for gold and silver, and the third fastest and fourth fastest go to ride-off for the bronze medal. So we're looking at one of these riders will go home without anything to show for the uh, and medals of term, but certainly will help with the country towards the uh, overall uh, North medals. And there we just saw that uh, Turig getting that one. She was faster than uh, 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 used in the uh, qualifying. And here, Emma Davis of Great Britain, on the left-hand side, was fastest in the qualifying with 3 minutes 40.40. Quite a surprise then, beating Catherine Bates on the right-hand side, the Australian 3.41.07 uh, when they qualified. And certainly, Emma Davis has got the crowd right behind her. Three kilometers. The men, of course, running over four kilometers, but uh, Emma Davis and one other one of the young riders from Great Britain 
along with Victoria Pendleton, who is really, really coming good in leaps and bounds. Simon Jones, the coach, and uh, Dave Brailsford, the team manager, have uh, coaxed the very best out of this young lady. Qualifying fastest and up against the number one on the back there. You can see Catherine Bates. It's never an easy task for Emma Davis. Remember, 12 points for victory into the overall competition, 10 for second place, 8 already uh, secured by Terren Turig of Switzerland. And uh, Verena Jus in coming fourth got 7 for her country. And the good news here for British supporters is that uh, Emma Davis, uh, who's got to so far in fourth spot then with 10 points in the overall competition, whatever she does today, it looks like she might be able to move over in the overall lead in the competition. But you stop against the woman here who won the women's points race yesterday, a very seasoned competitor. And there we are, 1 foot 15. Emma's begin to struggle just a little bit now, but can she be brought on by the crowd? Nearly a second down now, Emma, but uh, it's amazing how in this pursuit uh, you can time it so that you can come out fairly hard. Maybe Maybe relax a little bit, get into your stride, and then turn it on as you go onwards. Yes, that's right, because in the qualifying, Emma in the first uh, kilometre did a 1.16, and Cathy Bates was faster at a 1.15. So, in fact, Emma's got to put up the pace exactly what she did in qualifying. She went through in 2.28 the second kilometre, and Cathy Bates with 2.29. She was in the lead there, and she kept it. But can she bring something back out now? And it's getting closer, 0.558. 151 for... Emma Davis at the moment, and she's eating into Catherine Bates's advantage. She's got to keep her head, she's got to keep her rhythm going. Catherine Bates will know she's on her tail. 2.09, it's under five seconds now, 0.47 of a second. Emma Davis doing exactly what she has to do, but looking now as if she's putting maximum effort at Catherine Bates, I have to say, looking reasonably calm and collected at the moment, David. And I'd say Catherine's pushing a bigger gear. That's probably why she started slower. And uh, Emma Bates just dropped a little bit back out, pedaling quite smoothly. A, a typical pursuiter's look about her, but this is a powerful girl on the other side of the track who's now coming back as she did in qualifying. Bates making it look, uh, I won't say a lot harder, but th the smooth pedaling of Emma Davis no, she's dropped back a bit, point eight. Well, look at uh, Catherine Bates, still looking very smooth and calm. And look at the face of Emma Davis. She's really giving it absolutely everything, gritting her teeth. She knows she's got to fight, and now she's fighting to limit her losses. And she's beginning to rock a little bit. She's beginning to look as though she's trying to force those pedals round rather than spin them round, as opposed to this girl. Kathleen Bates is really, really working well, or even though, even though now she is uh, beginning to suffer. Emma Davis turning it on again. She's trying to kick again, and I don't think she's got it in her legs. Here comes the bell. Now she's suddenly gone, gone. She started so smoothly, as she did in qualifying, but Bates using all that strength, skill and experience. But Emma's still fighting here, and she, I'm sure, if my notes are correct here, that she's actually going to take the lead in the women's pursuit, and will she go to Australia? Um, because in which case, uh, she could be up against Bates again over there, as uh, so though, although she's second, she's got uh, herself, I think, probably in the overall lead. So there's something to show for that, but do bear in mind, we commentators have to do the sums ourselves, sometimes we get it wrong but I think she's got it. That'd be great for the, for the audience. Nations ranking then after day two. 88 points to Great Britain. Germany on 70, so Great Britain doing exceptionally well. France move up to third with 59. Russia on 53. Joshua Eng, you can see, has got points for Malaysia at the bottom. Eight points for them. Switzerland, who had a fall and a broken shoulder. 16 points, along with the Czech Republic. Twenty are still together. Australia sitting one and two at the front of the main field, but the British pairing of Jackie Marshall and Nikki Harris are still in the bunch here. Now then, if they can move forward, probably take a lead out off one of these Australians, they could be in with a chance of a medal. The pace is building all the time. When they get to the line this time, six to go. Australia riding very intelligently on the front. Well, Australia riding well. They're going to take this by the scruff of the neck. The, both the British girls are beautifully positioned at the moment just in the wheels just behind the Australians but they have to be careful not to get boxed in they're going the shortest distance round the bottom of the track if you get enough riders come around the top suddenly you find yourself with nowhere to go and I can certainly see Nikki Harris is watching that very very closely she's pushed herself out of there on a couple of occasions when the Australians really start to wind it up it line out 
and then they'll be perfectly placed. Well, the United States have realised that uh, the Aussies are riding to a game plan here, with Rhodes trying to lead out Bates, and as a reaction from the States trying to get on terms to spoil the party, and also trying to get in the hunt, it looked like... Uh, was it Rebecca Quinn trying to come through there, I think, or Mirabella trying to mix it and spoil it for the Australians? But they will not surrender the front. They're powerful riders. They're coming up to the line with three to go. And still right on the front, holding the inside line is Alexis Rhodes. Bates has been forced back in. That's not a good position for Bates. Bates is right back now, and she is... Uh, immersed in the wheels and she'll have a job to get out of that so it's going to be left to Alexis Rhodes here if uh, there's going to be a medal going Australia's way also up there is Catherine Sell of New Zealand on the outside and it's Sell of New Zealand that gets the head of the race now and the Australians actually are squeezed out of it but Bates has somehow or other got herself out of the problem and this is the bell lap and she's coming around the outside look at Bates looking for the third gold medal of this World Cup and I tell you what I think she's got the firepower in the legs to do it look at this what a display of power and strength and speed Bates hits the front with Contimides holding the tight line here she comes it's Goal to Australia, Bates takes it, tight on the line for the silver. Well, that will need tidying up. Moynard of France challenging uh, closely on the line there for silver, and it was either Mirabella or Quinn of the United States. So the silver is between those two. Here we are, Bates gets goal. Country mile ahead. Well, he... Oh, you tell me. Nicky Harris managed to sneak into fifth place there, riding tactically very well. A lot of pushing and shoving in the closing stages. She performed well for a young rider. So Nikki Harris, uh, I would say unofficially, snatched fifth place there, and that was a creditable ride by her. Here they are. This is the uh, last lap. Bates, perfect timing. She got herself out of the box, and then once she sort of released the power, nobody could uh, contain her. Well, the goal, that's uh, all been uh, done and dusted by this stage, but it was the competition behind, wasn't it, for the silver? And that is between the United States and France. It's the official result confirmed of the women's 10-kilometer scratch race. Goal number three here for Catherine Bates of Australia. Rebecca Quinn of the United States gets silver. And Virginia Moynard of France bronze. And a good ride by Nikki Harris, sealing fifth place. Well, Cathy, three gold medals here in Manchester. Not a bad weekend's work. Yeah, I, I'm stoked. I've never won a scratch race in my life, I think, so um, my form must be good. Which of those three achievements uh, mean the most to you here this weekend? Which are you most satisfied with? Um, I think the points race, because anything can really happen, and it's a really big goal for me for the World Championships. I stuffed up the Olympics a little bit, and it's left me with something that I really need to, to fix. Are you where you want to be in the season going into these World Championships in March? You know, on Thursday I probably would have said no, but after this weekend, definitely. You know, I've had a bit of a bumpy road until here, but hopefully with some smooth sailing come March, it'll be a good month. And of course, are you able now even to think about the, the Commonwealth Games coming up in Australia next year? Yeah, look, I think definitely Commonwealth Games in your home country is, is really a big thing, and, and the Australians are really planning everything towards that, so... You know, it's Worlds and, and a good road season, a nice break, a good preparation, everything for Commonwealth Games. Best of luck. Thanks very much, Cathy. That's great. Well, now to one of the real spectacles of track racing, the Madison. You may remember this one from the Olympic Games in the summer. We won a bronze medal with Bradley Wiggins and Rob Hales. That was despite Rob Hales having a spectacular crash in the final. Well, he teams up with Steve Cummings in this event today. And to take us through the complexities of the race, here's Hugh Porter. Well, this is Spain on the attack at the head of the main field. There are 12 laps remaining in this 160-lap Madison. And let me tell you that France and Belgium are lying in gold and silver medal positions. Those two nations have gained the all-important lap over the rest of the field. The pairing of Hales and Cummings, well, they've retired. Rob Hales, well, he was involved in a pretty horrible crash just a few laps ago when four teams came down. And I'm afraid that Rob Hales really did suffer. He was on the ground for a long time but I'm pleased to say that he's limped off and he looks to be OK. For Steve Cummings, well, his debut has been a baptism of fire. He's crashed and he has uh, also now been pulled out of the race. But they rode well while they were involved in the action. And the other British pairing in the race who are riding for their professional sponsored team, Recycling.co.uk, 
are the Downing brothers, Dean Downing and Russell Downing, and they've won one sprint so far, and they're lying joint eighth in the race. Nine laps to go. It certainly looks like it's going to be a sprint for the line, Hugh. I think everybody's decided that's going to be the case, just keeping the speed high. It's been a very brutal race, a lot of attacking, a lot of chasing. And I'm quite surprised that only two teams managed to take a lap. And it took a long time for them to gain that lap, but uh, they persevered, and eventually they did, of course, recapture the peloton, and that has decided the outcome of this Madison event and I must admit the crowd have enjoyed it and I've enjoyed it myself it's been a high-speed drama affair and we've got seven laps to go to the final sprint well Germany have got 12 points uh, lying in third place and what it would mean is the Netherlands or the Czech Republic and Kazakhstan would have to win the final sprint without Germany figuring to deny them bronze and it, and to well speculate even further if Belgium won the final sprint for the five points and France didn't figure they would beat France by one point but that will not happen because France are very very experienced and Jérôme Noville one of the pair from France is a former double world champion for this discipline well both of those teams seem to be content to just hang on to the back of the field I think they're going to leave the result as it is Belgium probably very happy with second place big loser of course with Germany who were leading the race when the two teams took that lap Germany are uh, lying second at the moment overall in the World Cup to the Czech Republic. They'll still pick up valuable points with one more round to go in Sydney. So the speed now beginning to lift significantly as they've got three laps to go for the final sprint. And the pace being uh, raised at the front by the pairing of Shershov and Yuda from Kazakhstan. Now here comes the long burst for the line for the final sprint. It's Russia coming through here and Denmark. Russia make the change with one and three quarter laps to go and Denmark also with perfect timing for their change they relay their sprinter in and the United States are clinging precariously to the back wheel of the United States uh, uh, to Denmark I should say here comes the change in the United States Martin Ostein the former Olympic sprint champion is relayed into the fray here for the final sprint but nobody's going to catch Denmark Denmark going to come through to catch uh, the line for five points they do the United States take the three the Netherlands take the two and fourth position I think that looked to me very much like uh, Russia who picked up the fourth spot in that final sprint in fact it was Germany that got the final spot but there saluting the crowd is uh, Jerome Nobile and Andy Figinger from France, the winners of the Madison. Final sprint, Denmark for five, the United States for three, the Netherlands for two. The overall results confirmed now of the Madison. And the winners are France, silver going to Belgium, and bronze to Germany. And I can tell you that uh, the Downing brothers, riding for their professional team of recycling uh, .co.uk finished a creditable 10th. Well, there is Rob Hales. Looks as though he's recovered fully now. And that is good news. I'm really pleased because that looked very bad to me. Here's a chance to look at it again. It's Spain. Mathieu coming through, but it looks as though he just flicked the left arm of Hales. And Hales has actually tried to alter his line, I feel, to try and miss the team of Kazakhstan who are ahead making a change. Victoria Pendleton leads the World Cup standings in the Kieran event. Now she's already won two silver medals here in Manchester this weekend but she won't be able to add to that in the Kieran final. She missed out on qualification but we will take a look at that final now with Hugh Porter. Five and a half laps to go then in this women's Kieran final and right on the back of the dirty bike there is Christian Mucha. Right behind Mucha, representing the United States, is Jenny Reed. Behind Jenny Reed, in third place, is the second German in this. So Panzer and Mucha of Germany are both in this final. They've done well to get through. And representing Russia is Oksana Grishina. Also there, Natalia Chilinskaya of Belarus. She's in last but one position at the moment in the green and red. Chilinskaya, a former double world champion at the back for Italy, number 29. Elisa Frissoni. And Frissoni was the silver medal winner in the world championships last year. 
Sanchez, the world champion, didn't make it through here. Three to go. And they get to the line this time. That means we'll lose a little motorbike. It'll drop into the well of the track, and then the riders can sort the tactics out themselves. Germany are beginning now to make a challenge at the front. The two riders from Germany trying to block out anybody else coming through and that seems to be the game plan for them right at the front at the moment it is susan panzer now is that going to change panzer's there and trying to come around the outside for germany is christian mucha and it's working at the moment and reed is tucked in and chilling sky is coming over on the outside for the challenge for Belarus, but Chilinskaya gets the head of the race right on time. And right behind her is Susan Panzer, and Chilinskaya has opened up a really big gap here. The former world time trial and sprint champion has left the rest for dead. Look at Chilinskaya takes gold. Oh, and on the line it was close, but the silver medal to Susan Panzer of Germany. And the bronze medal going to the United States and Jenny Reed. But that was perfect timing by Natalia Chilinskaya from Belarus. Belarus. No problem whatsoever for her. She decided to go using the height of the track, swept down past the opposition, and nobody had an answer to it. Official result of the women's Karin gold medal to Natalia Tilinskaya of Belarus, the silver to Susan Panzer of Germany, and the bronze to Jenny Reed of the United States. Well, a very convincing display there in the final of the Karin. No Victoria Pendleton, but it has been overall a pretty Good performance from the British women here this weekend. Three silver medals in all. How happy will they be with that, Chris? I think it was a very solid performance, and it's exactly where they want to be with just a couple of months ago to the World Championships. And, of course, we've had two young riders uh, riding today as well, and both of those quitted themselves particularly well. We didn't look at the overall result, just the snapshots that showed skill that we're going to be using in the future. Now, the men's team, the men's British cycling team, is very strong, with real medal prospects right through them. How healthy is women's cycling? I think women's cycling is looking really good, actually, particularly the youngsters we've just been talking about. Uh, there's quite a lot bubbling under. It's going to be difficult to develop that within the four years that we need for Beijing, but certainly within the eight, so I think it looks quite good at the moment. Loads to look forward to. I'll let you uh, have a rest for the moment, Chris, Thank because you. now we're going to concentrate on the men's team sprint. Now, this, in recent years, has been a bit of a banker for Great Britain. However, things didn't all go quite to plan in Athens. The team sprint, I know the guys were disappointed with, yeah. with the outcome in Athens. Half a lap to go, can Queeley, the Olympic champion from Sydney, bring them home ahead? I'll tell you, no, he can't. 0.120, Great Britain lose to Germany and they go out of the competition. Is, there, is that something that you're going to target this year, you specifically want to make up for come the World Championships? Yeah, you know, it was a big disappointment. Um, I think we all expected to get a medal. I think that was seen as the banker event, you know, the kilo was going to be a close one, but the, the team sprint was, we thought, was going to be the one we were going to get the medal in. So it's definitely a, a chance to try and exercise a few demons now and go back there and bounce back and show that we're, uh, you know, we should have got a medal and hopefully go through to Beijing and then set a few wrongs right. And I guess the fact that you are both going so well does mean that the team will benefit the team sprint. Hopefully, yeah. Um... I mean, the, 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 you know, we've all got important roles to pay, play within the team sprint. Um, and, you know, me and Chris are going well. And as I say, Craig is coming to form. And, uh, you know, as, as we know from Craig and that when he's in good form, then, you know, he can be the key to success in the team sprint. I think no one would argue that when you're on form, you are the man that can inspire this team sprint to success. Is there now that opportunity for you to do it here in front of the home crowd and take that into the, the World Championships in Los Angeles? I think at this point in time, it's just it's a bit early. You know, I think I'm still a long way off from my best. Um, I'll still be competitive, but you know, it's I'm, I don't have a point to prove. It's, it's what I'm trying to say. You know, I'm just going to go out there, do the best I can. You know, it'll be. I think regardless how we go, the home crowd are going to be supportive anyway. Um, I think come come March time when we come to LA, the World Championships, then all being well over the next few months, then I'll definitely be back where I, where I should be. So hopefully 2005 will prove to be a success for the British sprint team and certainly Craig McLean who was so disappointed 
with the way things went in Athens. What kind of form is he in at the moment, Chris? Well, Craig has had a hard time since Athens, but he's trained very hard. The last fitness he had just a few days ago wasn't absolutely conclusive, but I know that he has got a lot of experience in this event, and the other two team men as well, I suspect they're going pretty well. It's vitally important, isn't it, for him to give us that quick start in the sprint? The start is everything in the team sprint event. It's absolutely everything. And, of course, on his day, he is the fastest in the world. So I think in front of a home crowd, there's a good chance that he'll do a very solid start and the other two will be able to build on that. Because Chris and Jason are in tremendous form at the moment, aren't they, this early in the season? Well, they're so good, actually, that either of them could take the back man spot, the hardest position in the race. So uh, I think I think they know what they're doing. I think we look for a solid performance from them. And at this level, I think that may be enough. OK, let's see how they get on. We can get to it now with Hugh Porter. This is heat two, then, of the men's team sprint on the left of our screens. Great Britain on the right, starting in the back straight, are oh, Australia. The team for Great Britain starting Craig McLean, one of the fastest out of the gate in the world. The second lap will be Chris Hoy, the Olympic kilometre champion, and the anchor lap will be Jason Queeley, the former kilometre champion. Against them, Australia, Joe B. Dacre, Shane Kelly and Ben Kirsten. And the first lap tied it up there, and it really is very, very quick indeed. Let me tell you, the fastest time so far is competed by Greece at 46.080. But now, coming up to take the change in the final lap now, and Great Britain are really storming around the track here. They're leading Australia, and remember, we're looking for the quickest time. And Great Britain, of course, are fighting their way around the track now to go through to the final. Great Britain have taken Australia completely apart. A blistering time by Great Britain there, 44.479. And the time for Australia, 46.060. Well, Great Britain with that time will be through to the final and Chris Hoy is celebrating. That was some ride. Very, very impressive indeed. 44.479. And so early in the season as well. It's the starting effort by Craig McLean out of the gate. Awesome power by McLean. And it was McLean, of course, that underpinned the victory for the world title two years ago in Ballard up in Copenhagen because he put almost half a second into the Australians and they couldn't get it back. In fact, that was a repeat of the world final of two years ago. Great Britain winning the world title on that occasion. There is the result then of the qualification round of the men's team sprint and what it means now is that the ride-off for the gold and silver will be between Great Britain and Poland and the tussle for bronze will be between Australia and Japan. Well, this is the ride-off for the bronze medal in the team sprint, one of the most exciting disciplines in track racing. Australia on the left of our screen, starting in the home straight, and in the back straight are the team from Japan. Representing Australia, Yobi Dekka, who is starting first, and the second man will be Shane Kelly, former triple world kilometre champion, and the anchor lap will be Ben Kirsten. And the team from Japan is Narita, Oikawa and Watanabe. Well, Australia were the quickest in the first round, and it should be on paper a bronze medal for Australia as we now into the second lap. Blinken, you could miss this, it really is thrilling action. It's all on now and they're coming up to make the final change. The riders peel off and now it's the Japanese entering the closing lap and leading with the bit between their teeth. Work to do here then for Australia and it doesn't look as though the bronze medal is going to go that way. It looks very much as though Japan are going to steal the bronze. Japan come up to the line and take bronze and their time 46.30 nine they'll be pleased with that and fourth place in the competition goes to australia so that's the bronze medal competition done and dusted now we can look forward to the mouth-watering prospect of seeing the british express in action the final of the team sprint and this is between great britain and poland great britain starting in the home straight the experienced squad of Craig McLean who will lead off, followed by Jason Quill, the Olympic champion in Sydney, and the anchor lap will be Chris Hoy, the Olympic champion in Athens. Their opponents are Poland, led off by Rafał Furman, followed by Damian Zielinski, and the anchor lap for them will be Lukasz Kwiatkowski. Let me tell you, in qualification, Great Britain scorched around the track to 44.47, a very, very creditable time, and McLean, who's the quickest man in the world out of the gate, sets them up magnificently here. McLean 
Lane swings off, and now it's Jason Queerly, the Olympic gold medalist from Sydney, taking Chris Hoy round. And let me tell you, the opening lap for Craig McLean was 17.8. That is absolutely flying. Jason Queerly swings off, and now it's all about Chris Hoy, the Olympic champion. Poland are beaten. They're destined for silver. But what will the clock tell us at the end? Here comes Chris Hoy up to the line. Oh, what a time. 44.493 by Great Britain to take the gold medal. That was a very, very impressive performance indeed. So, Great Britain then take the gold medal here just fractionally slower than their ride in qualification, but a successful defence of the title that they won in the World Cup 12 months ago. So the trio then of Craig McLean, Jason Queerly and Chris Hoy win the gold medal for the team sprint. Poland win the silver medal, and Poland's finishing time, 46.010, and the bronze medal to Japan. Well, congratulations, guys. A great performance there, and Craig... How good did it feel to get back to winning ways? It's fantastic, yeah. I mean, at this time of year, to do the well, the overall time that we did was fantastic. You know, we're we're heading in the right direction now, anyway. How are you feeling? Because you had a bit of a crash earlier in the day and, and a bit of a problem with your ribs. Yeah, it's, I'm not aware of it when I'm actually trying, but I've, uh, I've cracked a rib. But it's, it's in the same place I've cracked it twice before, so it's obviously quite prone to snapping now. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's not, not a problem when I'm actually trying, so... Certainly didn't look a problem today, Jason. Uh, you're not much sympathy there for your teammate, but uh, a good performance. You must be happy with that. Yeah, as Craig was saying, overall, it's fantastic performance this time of year. To do two 44-4s, I think the, the ride that we did before was the third fastest time we've ever done. So we're about 11 weeks out from the World Championships to be in such good condition. It's very good because we've got all of us have got more form to come. So come the world, I think, hopefully we'll do it. And Chris, who do you think your main challenges are going to be come the World Championships in this team sprint? I would expect the Germans to be back to their full strength team by then. Um, obviously, the Australians are always pretty hot, and uh, maybe the French as well, because they were world champions last year. So it's not going to be easy, but we've got the bit between our teeth, and that was a really sort of confidence boosting ride today. And a great World Cup, as far as you're concerned. Yeah, I'm really happy. You know, to come out with two gold medals is uh, it's fantastic. I'm really happy. Um, the whole team though has performed really well, and I think we're in a in with a shout for the overall team, the, the overall classification here too, so fingers crossed. I think you have indeed. Well done. Congratulations. Thanks. Gold medal winners for the team sprint are the team from Great Britain. Craig McLean, Jason Queerley and Chris Hoy. Chris Hoy getting his gold medal first, Jason Quirley now receiving his, and the man that sets the team off out of the gate, Craig McLean. Their winning time, 44.493 seconds, and that is a successful defence of their gold medal position in the World Cup here last year, and it's the third gold medal won by Great Britain in this round of the World Cup. Well, an emphatic display from the team there, fantastic performance, another gold medal, and Chris, what did you make of it? Well, it was a fantastic ride. We know that Craig's been struggling a little bit with his form. Uh, he really put in a solid start, potentially even jumped the start there. It was, it was that good, he really got it, did get it on the B of bang, uh, but the team rode perfectly, put it together, they know what they're doing, did the job. Do you think we can win the World Championships in Los Angeles? Well, they're certainly in the right position now, just around about eight weeks still to go. The form is where it wants to be, because we've said a number of times during this competition, they don't want it to be perfect, so I'd say certainly. Well, that's the World Cup drawing to a close uh, here in Manchester, but we have another event coming up, the Japanese Kirin, another sprinter's event. How does this differ? What's the, the, the point of putting on this Japanese Kirin race here? Well, the Kirin racing is a very big betting sport in Japan. It's as big as horse racing is here. The Japanese Kirin Association want this to grow to a worldwide sport, so they're actually funding the competition in some of the World Cups to try and stimulate that. Whether that's going to work, I don't know, but I know that a lot of the riders here are enjoying the money. Well, Ross Edgar, of course, going for Great Britain. Absolutely. OK, let's see how they get on. Let's join you. Four laps to go, then, in this international Japanese Kirin. The riders here are competing for places from 7th through to 12th, and there's still a lot of prize money at stake. £45,000 overall in the pot. 
Right behind the Derny bike here is the rider from Malaysia, Josia Unge in second place. From the Czech Republic is Pavel Buron. Third is number 14, Rennie Wolf, Olympic champion for the team sprint. Then it's uh, Watanabe from Japan, a professional caring rider. Behind Watanabe, it's Ross Edgar from Great Britain. And the man right at the back, representing the uh, Netherlands, is Toon Mulder. Now then, when the little motorbike gets into the back straight now, it will drop into the well of the track, and then the riders will sort it out over the closing two and a half laps, and it's an early strike for home here by Pavel Buron, a man who, in his early years, was a silver medal winner in the World Championships for the tandem, so he's totally fearless, and believe me, the word Keirin means fight in Japan, and watch these fellas go, they don't take any prisoners. Huge roar going around the arena now, because it's Ross Edgar that comes to the front. Now Edgar said it himself up for seventh place overall in the contest. A sweet move by the 21-year-old British sprint champion. He's timed it to perfection. Buran of the Czech Republic's coming back at him, but I think that Edgar's going to do it. Edgar coming up to the line. Yes! Ross Edgar wins the minor final, placing him seventh in the contest. Looked like Pavel Buran of the Czech Republic coming in second there, which will finish uh, him in the contest eighth, and that crowd loved it. If only Ross could have got through to the final. That's history, of course, but here we go. Side shot to confirm the call. Edgar gets it from Buran, and it looked like uh, Josiah Unge from Malaysia coming through on the inside for third. So Ross Edgar finishes seventh overall in the contest. Babel Buran eighth, Josiah Unge ninth. So here comes a little dirty bite now to pick up the finalists for this, the Japanese Kirin final, sponsored by the Japanese Kirin Association. First prize is £10,000. So right behind the motorised bike is Gregory Bourge of France. Behind Gregory Bourge, it is Shane Kelly of Australia. Behind Shane Kelly, Ivan Verber of the Czech Republic. And behind Ivan Verba, Andrei Vinokurov from the Ukraine. Behind him, the second Frenchman in this event, and that is... Second Frenchman then right at the back there, just ahead of the Australian, that is Yobi Dekker. And Yobi Dekker, the former world champion two years ago. And the man just in front of Dekker is Mikhail Borgain. So these are the early stages. £10,000 to the winner, eight for second, 6500 for third, and the prizes go all the way down to 12th. Still on the back of a motorbike, it is France from Australia. Now, in the previous event, it was Australia, remember, and France together. Borges sitting in the last but one position. Just in front of Joby Dacre, the former world double champion. Dacre won his caring final in Antwerp 2002 in a fast and fierce Ford contest. Now then, the drone of the engine's beginning to lift here. It will pull it off the track with two and a half to go, and it'll be doing 50 k's an hour. And I tell you what, this really does make the adrenaline rush. It's big time in Japan, this. One of their biggest sports, and there's trillions of yen gambled on the totalizer. Now then, they're coming round to get to the line with two laps to go. It's still France at the front. Who's going to get this one? It's going to be a real tight one right on the front. Mikhail Bourguin and the second Frenchman right at the back is Gregory Borges and right on the front is Bourguin, a move by Dekka. Dekka, the former world champion, coming over the top. It's going to be one to go this time, remember the prize on the line, right on the front at this stage, still going very, very strongly. Indeed, is Borges and Bourguin, they're still in the hunt, the Frenchman, but the two Australians are trying to come through as well. Oh, on the line, it's going to be ever so tight, but France are going to take it, France take it on the line. Victory to Mikael Bourguin of France, and the French are celebrating. Well, the Australians were squeezed out of that one. I thought that they were going to tidy that one up, but it wasn't the case. We'll see a close shot on the side of that again.
There he is, the winner, Miguel Bourguin of France. Closing stage again. As they're coming down the straight here, let's see just who is going to win this. There's no problem as they're coming up to the line. The early stages prior to it. But it was France, wasn't it, that commanded it, and they did it in some style. I thought the Australians would have taken a firm grip on it, but they didn't. Just take a look right on the line. And it's victory there for Mikhail Bourguin from France winning that. Second was Shane Kelly, Gregory Borges coming in for third. So France first and third, and the Aussies having to settle for second. And there is the result confirmed. Mikhail Bourguin of France wins from Shane Kelly. And France posting third as well with Gregory Borges. Well, a thrilling finish to that Japanese Kieran event. It really is helter-skelter stuff out there, isn't it, Chris? I think it's been a great, great weekend of racing. I think the British teams perform really well, which is always nice on home soil, uh, particularly as they don't want to be in absolute peak form this close to a World Championships. What did you make of the Japanese Kieran? Was it worth putting it on here? Has it given the crowd something to cheer? Well, I know you won't get any objections from the riders because they've certainly made quite a few thousand pounds out of it. Obviously, it's such a big betting sport over there. They're trying to make it bigger. Uh, but whether the rest of the world will buy that, I'm not quite sure. We have seen some thrills and spills out there on the track, and at least we can report that Rob Hales and Steve Cummings have no ill effects after their uh, crash in the Madison. But uh, it's, it's not for the faint-hearted, is it? No, absolutely not. Steve Cummings particularly brave going into a Madison. His first real time in that event at this level was quite incredible he came down twice and the second time we actually saw him slightly smiling as he was still sliding on the tarmac so yeah very brave of him they've had their splinters removed and i'm sure they'll be well put back together ahead of the world championships but overall as you said a good performance from great britain they've come away with the victory at this world cup event how important is that well, I think we keep alluding to, to the World Championships and, of course, the World Cups is how they're going to qualify to get to that World Championships. Uh, you're not going to want, with around about eight weeks still to go, you don't want to be in perfect form. So they're exactly where they need to be. I think everyone can go away from this very, very happy. We haven't peaked too soon? No, I think you can see that the times aren't absolutely perfect. Uh, so with this amount of time still to go, it's exactly where you would want to be. Of course, no Bradley Wiggins come those World Championships, but mm. there seems to be a decent amount of strength and depth in this team. Yes, there is. I think a lot of the riders are going to carry it through from Athens. This is going to be, for sort of quite a few of them, this is going to be their last World Championships before they go away for, a, for literally a couple of years and do other things. And Chris Hoy is thinking about concentrating on the sprints just to have a little bit of a busman's holiday, as it were, so, uh, before they start to build up for the next Olympics. What's been your pick of the performances here, from certainly from the Great Britain side? Uh, I've actually enjoyed watching uh, the women, believe it or not. We've had two young contenders uh, here over the, the last couple of days. They've shown that we've really got something for the future there, which is very promising. Nicole Cook had a run out as well, of course, and I saw one or two things there that showed that she's going to, if she wants to, she could make this a gold medal winning event for her. Well, it's all good news, and Great Britain with the, a bag full of medals here at this World Cup event. That draws this from Sydney, the Pursuit Sorry champion, up on the top podium there. 106 points for Great Britain from Germany's 94. Five, France on 80, Russia on 69, and Australia just eking up to fifth with 66 points. Here is the overall tour standings, and Great Britain move up to third with 252 points.